Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Louise Harvey, um, and I'm welcoming the audience to the third European Sepsis Alliance annual meeting, exceptionally taking place online because of the current situation. The European Sepsis Alliance is one of the regional alliances of the Global Sepsis Alliance. It was established in 2018 with the aim to raise awareness about sepsis, reduce sepsis deaths, and advocate for the implementation of the WHO resolution on sepsis in Europe. I'd like to thank the speakers who are all involved in the current crisis for their commitment, despite the ongoing situ situation linked to COVID-19 and the unprecedented pressure that they're experiencing in their daily job. Today, we're going to hear from policymakers about how sepsis can be inserted and prioritised in the public health agenda, listen to updates by experts on the front lines of sepsis research and med medical care in different countries that have undertaken necessary action and significant steps, and discuss with survivors and experts what it takes to fight sepsis effectively. I have pleasure in introducing the first speaker, who will be Evangelos Giamarelos, who is specialised in internal medicine and in infectious diseases, and is chairman of the European Sepsis Alliance. He is Professor of Internal Medicine at the Medical School of the National and the Capodistrian University of Athens, and guest professor in the Centre for Sepsis Control and Care of, of the Jena University Hospital, Germany. Evangelos is chairman of the European Sepsis Alliance, president of the European Shock Society, and coordinator of the Hellenic Sepsis Study Group. Uh, I'd like to hand the floor to him now. Well, thank you very much, and I'm really honored to uh, chair this uh, session and to welcome all of you today. Uh, as the chairman of uh, the European Sepsis Alliance, it's a great honor for me, and it's also a great honor as being the, as having this uh, position. Uh, I have to uh, admit that uh, it is a real uh, difficult uh, time, the situation where we are getting through uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, and actually the difficult thing and the sadness is what has recently been published that among all patients who are uh, mechanically ventilated and intubated, uh, those who will eventually survive is only just a tiny fraction. So the real big question is, okay, COVID-19 generates, or as per se, as a severe respiratory failure. However, the question is not just to combat uh, COVID-19. It's also to combat bacterial sepsis that can be uh, a sequelum of the intubation of these patients. So nowadays, uh, getting uh, a symposium of the European Sepsis Alliance and the call to action uh, is more important than ever. Uh, with this sense, I would like to welcome you, uh, and I'm really looking forward uh, to this to a very fruitful meeting where we need to understand that we need to be united more than ever. We need to exchange information more than ever because we are combating nothing more than a phantom menace and a threat to humanity. Thank you for those uh, introductory remarks. I would now like to turn to Mr. Ortwin Schulter, <laughs> who since 2017 has been the head of the health unit at the permanent representation of Germany to the European Union. And of course, Germany uh, will assume the presidency of the European Union next. Mr. Schulter has worked in the German Ministry of Health uh, and from 2001 to 2005 was head of the health unit at the Federal Chancellor's Office in Berlin. From 2005 to 2007, he was head of the EU Presidency Task Force in the German Ministry of Health before being head of the Bilateral Relations Unit from 2008 to 2016. Since 2011, he's been an associate professor at the Medical and Pharmaceutical University in Chisinau in the Republic of Moldova. Mr. Schulter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, a warm welcome to this conference from Brussels. Normally, it would be my task to do the housekeeping and to welcome all participants here 
It is a permanent representation of uh, Germany in Brussels. However, times of crisis are as such that the access to the permanent representation is limited to a small number of um, administrators, and certainly um, the times aren't so that we can be in close contact. But on the other hand, I fully welcome that we have this meeting now um, on a digital um, in a digital way, and uh, I think in many ways this creates also patterns of cooperation which in the future will be um, pursued. You were mentioning the German presidency, which starts at the 1st of July this year, and it's very certain that um, COVID-19 will not only overshadow the Croatian presidency, but it will also be uh, require nearly a complete um, restart of the preparations for the German presidency, simply because the priorities now um, changed a lot. Um, one thing that um, I would say, and this is generally also relevant for the field of um, uh, sepsis, is that in the history of the EU, it was often um, a crisis that was the starting point for increased European cooperation. If I think, for instance, uh, 25 years ago on the crisis um, on contaminated blood products, or some 17 years ago, BSE crisis, smallpox, pox vaccination, or Ebola, all of them have, in one way or another, be a starting point for increased cooperation, and we can also see that also COVID-19 will be such a starting point. I won't say much about the interrelation of COVID-19 and sepsis. We will certainly have more competent people speaking to that, and uh, so I would welcome you from behalf of the permanent representation of Germany to the EU. And thanks to the organizers for their commitment and for rescheduling this important meeting in these difficult times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schulter. Um, I would now like to invite the president of the Global Sepsis Alliance, Professor Conrad Reinhardt, to speak to us. Professor Reinhardt is recognized as an international champion of sepsis. He's chair of the Global Sepsis Alliance and a key initiator of World Sepsis Day and, World, and the World Sepsis Congress. He's a member and was chairman of the International Sepsis Forum and a member of the Council of the World Federation of Societies of Intensive and Critical Care um, Medicine from 2008 to 2013. In Germany, he's a member of the German National Academy of Science Leopoldina and chair of the German Sepsis Foundation. He was founding president of the German Sepsis Society and its president from 2001 to 2009. As a speaker of the nationwide German research network SEPNET, he initiated landmark studies on the efficacy and safety of therapeutic approaches in sepsis, as well as on the epidemiology of sepsis in Germany. He was initiator of the Center for Sepsis Control and Care at Jena University Hospital, and his research activities in the field of sepsis and intensive care medicine led to more than 750 peer-reviewed publications and the research award of the federal state of Thuringia, Germany. As senior professor at the CSCC, his publicly funded research is focused on quality improvement of sepsis management and long-term scali of sepsis. Professor Reinhardt, um, the floor is yours. Thank you indeed for this kind introduction. Esteemed representatives of European and national health authorities, dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, we are currently facing a traumatic health crisis. And that's why this gentleman, the Surgeon General from the US in the 70s, was wrong when he claimed that the book of infectious diseases can now ultimately be closed. He came to this conclusion by the fact that indeed the crude death rate from infections in the US 
decreased between 1900 and 1950 dramatically. It was just overlooked that there was a spike in 1919, which was due to what is now called the Spanish flu, a most dramatic pandemic which costed more than 50 million lives, which at this time was about 3% of the world population. Bloomberg quoted that America has a 27 billion sepsis crisis because sepsis is the number one cost driver for hospital costs in the US. And a recent report suggests that it's not only 20, 27 billion, but 62 billion, which is spent on sepsis healthcare costs. And this is a study supported by the US Department of Health and Human Services. This paper by the authors of the Global Burden of Disease Report suggests that there are annually 49 million cases of sepsis and 11 million deaths, which represents about 20% of all deaths worldwide. There's also good news that between 1990 and 2017, mortality decreased by 53%. But what we should make clear here that we are not talking about a pandemic, but about an endemic, meaning that this is an everyday occurrence. And this should remind us that we must address infectious diseases and the problems that come along with it also on a daily basis. This report in The Lancet may even underestimate the true burden of sepsis in high-income countries. This data from the US, which were derived from electronic health records and not by documentation in the so-called International Classification of Diseases by WHO, came to the finding that it's about 1.7 million cases per year in the US, whereas this report by the Lancet came only to a number of 900,000. Likewise, mortality rate differed considerably. And this was also true for a report from Sweden, which also was based on health records, and they extrapolated from their study that Sweden they may face annually 60,000 deaths from sepsis. And if you assume that the incidence and the death rate from sepsis in Europe is similar to that in Sweden, you end up with more than 3 million deaths, uh, cases of sepsis, and about 680,000 deaths from sepsis. So that's why we would like to, to understand better the true burden of sepsis in Europe. And this means that we cannot rely on the ICD coding because we know that depending from country to country, it may be as low as 15 to 50 percent uh, of sepsis cases that are really present, which are not documented in these systems. And you might ask, why are the numbers of sepsis so high? It's due to the fact that, by definition, sepsis is a common final pathway from infections and that most types of microorganisms can cause sepsis including bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites. And this was set out and confirmed by the WHO sepsis resolution. And in this resolution, it is also set out that sepsis most often presents as the clinical deterioration of common and preventable infections, such as those of the respiratory, 
gastrointestinal and urinary tract or of infections from wounds and skin. That is why it is not surprising that also deaths from the coronavirus mostly result from sepsis or septic shock. Lack of resources and structural deficits of the health systems may explain differences in outcome. Of course, and not surprisingly, this is especially an issue for low and middle income countries. However, there are differences in sepsis outcome among high income countries. And this also suggests that there's a lot of room for improvement in these countries. And it's true what the new Assistant Director General of the WHO, Naoki Yamamoto, said, that sepsis can be seen as a mirror of the quality of healthcare. And it's also true, if you look at these figures, what the new Director General of WHO said, that it's a tragedy that most of the 6 million deaths, and we have just learned that it's not 6 million, but 11 million, among them, 1 million babies are preventable. Preventable by simple, not expensive measures, such as vaccination, clean care, early recognition and treatment of sepsis as an emergency like heart attack or stroke. And as I said before, sepsis is a mirror on the quality of the health systems. And there's this excellent report, annual report, by the EU Commission on the performance of the healthcare systems within the European Union. And this effectiveness of the healthcare system is measured by the number of preventable deaths in each country. And given the fact that most likely sepsis is the number one cause of preventable death and disability in Europe, sepsis should become part of further reports. Let's come back to pandemics. There's a common feature of pandemics which was described by Hippocrates already 500, 400 years before Jesus Christ. And he called it sepsis. And he described sepsis as the process by which flesh rots, its rank disease producing and evil. However, it took almost 2000 years from then before Robert Koch from Berlin recognized and proved that infections are caused by microorganisms. And it took almost 200 years more than the WHO in 2017 acknowledged that sepsis is a syndromic response to infection and the final common pathway to death from most infectious diseases worldwide. Due to this fact, Sir William Osler is still right that humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine and war. And of these, the greatest, by far the most terrible, is fever. During World War II, awareness for sepsis was very high. This is a poster with which the Department of Health from England informed their soldiers on the danger of sepsis. And they claimed, and probably they were right, that sepsis has more victims to this discredited than the whole of the German fighters forces, fighting forces put together. And they understood already at this time that it is usually defeated by immediate first aid. However, awareness for sepsis dramatically decreased after World War II, and this is why sepsis even in 2020 2012 was not sufficiently addressed on the WHO website. There was no information on sepsis by the US Center of Disease Control and any other national center of disease control. 
sepsis was not sufficiently represented in the Global Burden of Disease Report. Sepsis was not part of the curricula for medical students and nurses, and the word sepsis was hardly used by press and media when we launched the World Sepsis Declaration and World Sepsis Day in 2012. And this had also dramatic effects on the knowledge of lay people over the last decades. This representative poll from Germany suggests and found that only 17 of the citizens knew that vaccination may help prevent sepsis. 23% thought that sepsis results from an allergic reaction. 30% believed that sepsis primarily resulted from an allergic from killer bugs and the majority of respondents was of the opinion that a red stripe on the arm is a key symptom of sepsis. And this means that lack of awareness kills because of the inadequate vaccination rates that we face and the fact that poor knowledge on sepsis delays that patients seek help have a look on this influenza and pneumococcal vaccination rates, which is quite different and pretty low, unfortunately, in Germany compared to US, UK and Australia. And lack of awareness also results in poor funding for research. This is a slide from 2011, where we found that compared with the incidence of these diseases, sepsis, stroke, cancer, heart diseases, and HIV, you see that uh, this, this dramatic differences in the incidence, but on the other hand, also the poor funding for sepsis research. Those times, and this has not changed much differently over the last years. Also, the authors of this report called their report just say sepsis, because when they looked in more than 2,000 health records of UK hospitals, they found that in 40% of cases, there were delays in antimicrobial therapy, which, according to their opinion, impaired outcome because sepsis was not recognized in due time. In 60% of these patients, the deaths were not reported in the death certificates of being due to sepsis. And in 50% of discharge reports, sepsis was not even mentioned as a cause of death. And that's why it was so important that also the WHO relution made the point on the need to increase public awareness that everybody understands that infectious diseases might progress to sepsis and that it's needed that also healthcare workers and professionals know both on the need for infection prevention and patient safety and it's important and the importance of recognizing sepsis early because it's a time critical condition with urgent, urgent therapeutic needs. And probably most importantly, this resolution urges member states to include prevention, diagnosis and treatment of sepsis in national health systems, strengthening in the community and in the health settings. There are countries which have done this. So in the UK, they have done a great job because at the bus stops and almost everywhere, you can read, and this is empowerment of patients, just ask, could it be sepsis? When you seek for help because it's so often overlooked or misdiagnosed. And every family who gets a child receives a booklet with an information on the early symptoms of sepsis in babies, but also in elder children. And there is a 24-7 phone number, which these patients and families may call when in doubt. And the overall increase of awareness 
and quality improvement efforts on sepsis led to an increase of the numbers of patients which were identified early and treated early with antimicrobials from a range between 30% up to 80%. And this went along with the decrease of mortality rate in these patients from 30% to about 20%. And there are other reports in this case from the state of New York where Governor Cuomo asked all hospitals with a mandate to apply evidence medicine, which means treating patients early within the first hour with antimicrobials and to do other urgency measures. And this slide and picture demonstrates that with every delay in the administration of antibiotics, in this case, mortality rates increase. Overall, those patients who were treated with and along these protocols, and we are talking about 75,000 patients, had a 5% lower mortality over a less than two-year period, whereas those patients who did not receive these protocols, 17,000 patients, even demonstrated a trend towards higher mortality. And there are similar data from Ireland who also trained the healthcare workers and physicians in all their hospitals over the last years. And you see how mortality rate from sepsis went down. So we can learn a lot of countries with low and fast decreasing mortality rates. They have high priority on patient safety and quality improvement and standards in general. But they also have effective programs on infection prevention and control. They train their healthcare workers in early detection of deteriorating patients. They have early warning scores and they train each healthcare workers on it. They have rapid response teams. They are not waiting for reanimation teams and they have mandatory critical incidence reporting. So these standards and quality indicators must become goals for the European Union and any national health strategy. And that's why our call to action for EU institutions and authorities is please encourage EU member states to implement the WHO sepsis resolution. Define common approaches through a revised European One Health Action Plan, which should include a comprehensive AU infection management program, exchange of best practices on sepsis prevention and sepsis response, integrate sepsis in the state of health in AU, report on the quality of the health systems of member states, a harmonized EU data collection method on the incidence of sepsis and AMR, and research on prevention of infection risks. The launch of a European observatory for sepsis, and we should have jointly a foster awareness for sepsis by a European Sepsis Week in September and support World Sepsis Day. Last but not least, we should support and empower patients and families who suffered or have lost loved ones. Let me finish with some conclusions which were published in the Journal of Science. The authors of an article on the Spanish flu in 1919 concluded that the great lesson of the pandemic is to call attention to the prevalence of respiratory diseases in ordinary times, to the indifference with which they are ordinarily regarded. And they also concluded that these pandemics must be controlled by administrative procedures and by the exercise of appropriate measures of self-protection. This means that policymakers, health authorities, jointly 
with the physicians jointly with patients can make a difference and what we are seeing currently now that this is the only way to overcome this traumatic sepsis crisis or health crisis we face and we can overcome it only jointly and this is what our struggle as European Sepsis Alliance, as Global Sepsis Alliance and as the national movements who aim for patient advocacy and to increase awareness are about. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Professor Reinhardt, for that um, arresting overview and the call for action as well. Um, I'd like to remind all the participants of the audience um, in this um, uh, live stream that they can ask questions um, by utilizing the chat box, the public audience chat box, uh, and please um, put your questions there for the speakers uh, which follow, and I will then relay them to the speakers um, so that we can have uh, an interactive uh, experience. But um, I'd like now to move on to our first keynote speaker, um, who is um, Mrs. Teresa Quartz, who is a pediatric intensive care physician with a Master of Science in Global Health Sciences and a PhD in Global Health Sciences clin Clinical Research in Process. She studies pediatric sepsis etiology, prognostic biomarkers, and clinical outcomes in East Africa, and is currently acting as a sepsis guidelines and coordinating consultant at the WHO headquarters in Geneva. Um, clearly, the guiding role of the WHO is essential in the fight against sepsis, um, and Mrs. Quartz uh, uh, recently joined the WHO WHO team that the Global Sepsis Alliance has been working closely with. So, Mrs. Quartz, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction and also for the opportunity to present today. So, as mentioned, I'll be telling you today about WHO's strategy to fight sepsis. I want to start by saying WHO really has a long history of combating sepsis, maternal and neonatal sepsis, infectious diseases that can lead to sepsis, as well as infection prevention and control, water sanitation and hygiene vaccine preventable diseases, really the list goes on. But currently WHO is focusing on two large global health initiatives, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Triple Billion, both of which are directly linked to sepsis. So sepsis is a significant cause of death in mothers, children, especially newborns, and decreased sepsis mortality would directly contribute to SDGs 3.1 and 3.2, which aim to reduce global maternal mortality and end preventable death of newborns and children under five years. If we can decrease sepsis incidence and mortality, that's also linked to SDG 3.3, which aims to end the epidemics of AIDS, TB, and malaria, and ne neglected tropical diseases, which are all infections that can increase the risk of sepsis and sepsis-related death. Sepsis outcomes are also likely to improve with SDG 3.8 achievements, which are in universal healthcare, as well as the triple billion target of having 1 billion more people benefiting from universal health coverage and decreased sepsis incidence and mortality are key to the triple billion target of one billion more people enjoying better health and well-being within five years. Aligning with these global health goals, at the 70th World Health Assembly in May 2017, the member states adopted a resolution on improving the prevention, diagnosis, and management of sepsis and requested the WHO address four key aspects. The first was to develop WHO sepsis guidance. The second was to draw attention to the public health impacts of sepsis and identify approaches for the timely diagnosis and management of sepsis. The third was to support member states to fight sepsis. And the fourth was to collaborate to enhance sepsis prevention and treatment. So to that end, WHO has developed a cross-cutting, multidisciplinary, and collaborative approach to bring together experts with diverse backgrounds, training, and expertise to address the incidence, mortality, and long-term complications of sepsis. The first critical step was to hold a sepsis technical expert meeting, which took place in January of 2018. And it was at this meeting that the WHO and experts from around the world identified the key gaps as well as players and short and long-term priorities for action. The priorities for action that were identified were comprehensive and multidisciplinary. And you can see they range from awareness raising activities to guidelines and implementation to research and networking. It was really these priorities that laid the foundation for WHO's sepsis efforts. 
So as mentioned, the first ask of the Director General from the resolution was to develop guidance on sepsis prevention and management. WHO is currently developing guidelines for the clinical management of sepsis with the following goals. To develop clinical case definitions that can be used in all resource settings to provide clinical management from a patient's first contact with the health system to the intensive care unit. It's also applicable to all resource levels and includes both adults and children and to develop a sepsis management toolkit for first-line providers. WHO has developed several clinical training resources and tools for the prevention, early detection, and management of sepsis. A few of these key things include the Severe Acute Respiratory Infection Critical Care Training Course in the COVID-19 Guidance, which includes specific sections on the management of sepsis and shock, prevention of infections in health facilities, which contribute to healthcare-associated sepsis, basic emergency care and Ebola advanced clinical care training courses, both of which address the management of sepsis and shock, and training on the management of possible serious bacterial infection, which is a clinical diagnosis that encompasses sepsis in neonates and young infants, specifically when referral is not possible. The second ask of the Director General was to draw attention to the public health impact of sepsis and to identify approaches for integrating timely diagnosis and management of sepsis into healthcare systems that already exist. So this includes the writing and publication of the first ever Global Sepsis Epidemiology Report, which will include data on the global burden of adult, neonatal, maternal, and healthcare-associated sepsis, as determined by WHO-led systematic reviews and primary research. The report also addresses research methodologies, as well as challenges and limitations in the current research. And perhaps most importantly, it lays out a roadmap for sepsis, including how to address the current research gaps in defining a global health uh, sepsis agenda. On May 5th, 2018, WHO led a large-scale global sepsis awareness campaign and called on health workers, infection prevention and control leaders, health facility leaders, ministries of health, and patient advocacy groups to prevent both community and hospital-acquired sepsis through the use of hand hygiene and infection prevention and control actions. This also included a campaign toolkit, which is freely accessible to all. The WHO Global Maternal Sepsis Study assessed the burden and management of maternal sepsis in health facilities and was coupled with an awareness campaign. So the cohort study included over 2,000 pregnant women admitted or hospitalized with suspicion or diagnosis of infection in one of more than 700 participating facilities in 53 primarily low- and middle-income countries. There were an estimated 70 suspected or confirmed maternal infections per 1,000 live births, and infection was the underlying cause of half of the maternal deaths in the study. The Gloss Awareness Campaign included an online Congress printed materials, social media, and press releases that aimed to improve uh, providers' knowledge of maternal sepsis on diagnosis and management. To improve the timely diagnosis of sepsis, WHO recently published the International Classification of Diseases, Revision 11, which facilitates the reporting of sepsis as a risk factor for death as well as for long-term sequelae. Following a WHO technical consultation in in vitro diagnostics for antimicrobial resistance in March of last year, WHO subsequently published both a landscape and the model list of essential IVDs, including those that help diagnose sepsis. And finally, WHO led the development of a consensus definition of maternal sepsis, and this helps to standardize terminology and diagnostic criteria that both clinicians and researchers can use. The third ask of the Director General is to support member states to fight sepsis. To address this, WHO established the global surveillance of antimicrobial resistance to improve the quality as well as the quantity of data on the epidemiology of AMR and help inform health policy decision-making. GLASS aims to provide the capacity to monitor AMR trends and produce reliable and comparable data and also inform antimicrobial options for treatment. As of last month, there were 89 countries and territories participating, and that included 55 low- and middle-income countries. During the 2019 data call, 66 countries submitted AMR data contributing to the global effort to report cases of sepsis due to antimicrobial-resistant infection. Furthermore, the AMR categories in the ICD-11 have actually been completely so that they reflect current science, and they allow for greater flexibility as new emerging AMR entities arise. In addition, WHO has developed many tools to fight sepsis. WHO and UNICEF published baseline data for the first time on the state of WASH in healthcare facilities, and along with partners including NGOs and the World Bank, issued solution-focused resources to support WASH improvements, including a facility-based improvement tool 
squash fit, as well as advocacy resources. This was accompanied by a World Health Assembly resolution on WASH, which was approved last year. WHO, in collaboration with the International Committee of the Red Cross and Médecins Sans Frontières, developed the Integrated Interagency Triage Tool, which provides an integrated set of triage protocols that ensures that both adults and children who present with high-priority diseases like sepsis are identified early and that their management is prioritized. And finally, WHO facilitated implementation research and the scaling up of the new possible serious bacterial infection guidelines, which are for neonates and young infants across numerous African and Asian countries. The final ask of the Director General was to collaborate with other organizations to enhance sepsis prevention and treatment. In September 2017, WHO collaborated with the Global Sepsis Alliance to co-organize a World Sepsis Congress Spotlight event on maternal and neonatal sepsis. I'm happy to say that WHO and GSA are collaborating on a second spotlight event on sepsis and antimicrobial resistance, which will be held later this year. In terms of ongoing WHO collaborations and partnerships, WHO is collaborating with the Surviving Sepsis Campaign to create comprehensive, inclusive clinical guidelines for sepsis with the Neonatal Antimicrobial Resistance Group and to develop uh, new globally applicable empiric antibiotic regimens and strategies for neonatal sepsis. WHO is also collaborating with UNICEF to launch a global report, Survive and Thrive, Transforming Care for Every Small and Sick Newborn on Inpatient Care of Small and Sick Newborns, which will include neonatal sepsis management, as well as ways to address the quality of neonatal services. And finally, with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, international and national experts to develop a value proposition for the Group B strep vaccine. WHO has many ongoing and planned sepsis initiatives, and this list is not exhaustive, but just to give you an idea of some of the things that we are continuing to do. uh, We hope to increase country participation in GLASS, as well as have broader implementation of the PSBI, um, ongoing development and implementation of training materials on newborn care, as well as developments of standards of care for sick and small newborns, uh, integration of standardized sepsis case definitions into ICD-11, Uh, standardized sepsis data recording, coding, and reporting using ICD-11. The Global Maternal Sepsis Initiative is to advance research on early detection of maternal sepsis, specifically in low-resource settings. The COVID-19 toolkit is eminently coming out. Development of a sepsis clinical management toolkit and guidelines, a global report on WASH in healthcare facilities, as well as the latest trends and strategies to strengthen WASH efforts. And then updates to WASH FIT are ongoing, including climate resilience and a new training package. So thank you very much for your attention. I do want to acknowledge all of my many uh, colleagues for all of their excellent work, as well as our partners, without whom we could not possibly do all of this. So thank you very much. I'm open for questions. Thank you very much um, for that insight. Um, uh, there is a question for uh, from the audience that I wanted to put to you, and I would just say that we have over 300 people that are currently following the conference online. The question that I'd like to put to you is whether you could explain the difference between sepsis caused by bacteria uh, and sepsis caused by a virus like COVID-19. Well, really, they're... They're the same clinical syndrome, and so all of this is a spectrum of disease. Sepsis, as Dr. Reinhardt mentioned, is uh, really the syndrome of organ dysfunction caused by a presumed or um, confirmed infection. So whether that's bacterial or viral, really, in my eyes as a clinician, the biggest difference is that if it's bacterial, you know that uh, or you hope that you can treat it with known antimicrobials. Uh, Clearly, if it's viral sepsis, the challenges in treating become much more difficult and you have to rely more on supportive care. Okay, thank you. If there's no more questions at this stage um, from the audience, then I will move on to the next um, keynote speaker, um, who is John F. Ryan and is Director of the European Commission's Public Health, Country Knowledge and Crisis Management Directorate and has had that position since September 2016. He's currently also the Commission's representative on the board of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. And clearly the Commission can play a key role uh, in including sepsis in their policy agenda uh, and also in facilitating the exchange of best practices amongst member states. So, uh, Mr. Ryan, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, colleagues, and thank you for the invitation to the meeting uh, this afternoon. 
Um, so I'd like to thank the European Sepsis Alliance for organizing the meeting and to acknowledge the important work done by the Alliance and its member organizations in raising awareness and stimulating action on sepsis. The conference com comes at a, an opportune time to raise extra awareness about sepsis as we're currently dealing with the COVID-19 virus, which is a serious cross-border threat, and in some severe cases can also lead to sepsis. Currently, the Commission is actively supporting the EU member states and the international community to stop the further spread of COVID-19. The Commission works with the EU member states, our agencies, in particular the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control, and the European Medicines Agency, together with the World Health Organization, to ensure proper coordination and response to the current health threat. Moreover, at the global level, countries around the world have signed up to the International Health Regulations, which is a treaty of the World Health Organization. This sets out some basic preparedness and response standards for serious cross-border threats to health, and all of the EU member states are, of course, contracting parties to that treaty. Every year in the EU, more than 46,000 people die because of sepsis, and the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control estimates that more than 3 million healthcare associated infections occur in the European Union every year. So this is a very substantial public health topic and problem. And the issue of sepsis, healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial resistance are closely interlinked, of course, and therefore we give our attention to the following objectives. The appropriate use of antibiotics, uh, improvements concerning the prevention of infection through the health systems, and thirdly, to the development of new antimicrobials, vaccines, and other means to treat infections. The main responsibility for these actions, of course, lies with the EU member states, given the division of <coughs> competence between the European Union and the member states, most of the public health responsibility is with the member states, particularly for health systems. However, the European Union plays an important supporting role, which we take very seriously. I'd like to mention, for example, that in 2009, the European Council adopted a recommendation on patient safety, including prevention and control of healthcare associated infections. Consequently, member states have implemented detailed plans to reduce infection in the healthcare systems, and the Commission has supported this action by funding initiatives research and reporting back on progress. Secondly, uh, the coordination with the member states is crucial. And with this in mind, the European Union adopted in 2013 a legal decision on serious cross-border threats to health. It provides a framework for cooperation between the EU and its member states. And the framework is based on surveillance, an early warning system, risk assessment, and preparedness and response across Europe. Consequently, this framework is, of course, used to combat the coronavirus outbreak as well. And thirdly, uh, sepsis and antimicrobial resistance are closely related. An estimated 33,000 people die each year in the European Union from resistant infections, and we anticipate that this will increase greatly uh, by 2050 as increased uh, antimicrobial resistance reduces our ability to treat infection. Serious complications arise when infections become untreatable and trigger sepsis. Therefore, the European Union is taking crucial steps against antimicrobial resistance, guided by the European One Health Action Plan, launched in 2017. The action plan combines multiple strands of Commission's work, covering, for example, food safety, animal health and public health, but also the environment, agriculture, research, trade, and international cooperation. Uh, within this uh, action plan, the aim of the Commission is to ensure that all EU member states have a comprehensive national AMR action plan to raise the standards in all countries to the same level. In order to reach this, prudent use of antimicrobials has to be promoted, together with raising awareness and understanding of antimicrobial resistance. Better coordination is required to improve infection prevention and to collect comprehensive data through a One Health surveillance system. In addition, the action plan includes the support for research and innovation in order to support actions on detection, infection control, and new therapeutics. 
but also to bridge knowledge gaps, such as the impact on AMR in the environment. Furthermore, AMR is not just a European problem, therefore the action plan focuses to reinforce engagement and collaboration with multilateral organizations and non-EU countries. And a close coordination with the Sepsis Alliance is an important part of this approach. Research, development, innovation are crucial to providing novel solutions and tools to prevent, diagnose and treat healthcare associated infections and sepsis. And therefore we actively support research and innovation on antimicrobial resistance and on sepsis. For the past 10 years, the European Union has invested almost 100 million euros specifically on sepsis related research. For instance, the Sepcell project investigates stem cell treatment for severe sepsis caused by pneumonia and several other projects are developing diagnostics and validating new sepsis markers. Furthermore, our new research program Horizon 2020 also supports research on sepsis-related issues, including uh, methods of infection prevention and the development of new antimicrobials and technologies which may be used in patients with sepsis. In addition, the Commission is reinforcing its support to national vaccination efforts including through a joint action with our member states on vaccination, led by France and co-funded from the health programme. This will foster sustainability on vaccination and strengthen health systems, taking into account synergies between vaccination and the use of antibiotics. Furthermore, a special funding instrument, the InnoFin Infectious Diseases Instrument, was created with European Investment Bank, provide loans to innovators in this area, and much of this research also supports the work on sepsis. Um, we remember that in 2017, the WHO adopted a resolution on improving prevention, diagnosis, and clinical management of sepsis. And as mentioned before, the Commission will support member states in their actions on health and continue to support member states to develop and implement national sepsis plans that are mentioned in the WHO resolution. In the first instance, the Commission will take forward this work in the context of our work on patient safety and healthcare associated infections more generally. And today's event, today's conference, is a crucial moment to strengthen our prevention efforts and, and also to improve our treatment options. By raising awareness, uh, coordinating with stakeholders and driving forward action, we can eliminate many preventable deaths. And the Commission looks forward to working with you all and with the European Sepsis Alliance towards that very goal. Thank you again for organizing today's discussion in these difficult uh, circumstances. I think it's important to continue work, and uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present some of the Commission's activities here today, and I'd be very happy, of course, to answer any questions you might have. Unfortunately, I will have to leave the meeting uh, shortly because we have a Council of Ministers uh, daily teleconference but if you um, certainly make notes of any, any questions you may have, I can come back at a later date and circulate the answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ryan. And of course, we understand um, that you have pressing things to uh, attend to at the moment. The one question <clears throat> is, has been that um, people would be interested in seeing any slides or any collateral materials, if it's possible to share at a later date um, the contents of some of your remarks, um, that would probably be helpful. But thank you. We can certainly do that. I'll do that already this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, with that, um, I will move on, therefore, to um, the first panel, which is going to focus on national sepsis plans and the, and the state of play uh, uh, with regard to national sepsis plans. Uh, and this panel session is going to be moderated by Dennis Credler, who is a sepsis survivor and amputee. Um, De Dennis is Vice President of the Global Sepsis Alliance and Chair of the Policy and Stakeholder Engagement Working Group of the European Sepsis Alliance. He's going to be joined um, on the panel by Christopher Stralin, who's Chairman of the Swedish Sepsis Plan and has been appointed by the Swedish government to coordinate and implement the National Sepsis Plan. Ron Daniels is the founder and executive director of the UK Sepsis Trust and NHS consultant in intensive care. 
He's worked with the UK government on three national action plans on sepsis and helped secure the WHO resolution on sepsis in 2017. Jilali Anan is Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Versailles Paris-Saclay and the Head of the Critical Care Department at Raymond Poincaré University Hospital in Gash, Paris. In the past two years, he's worked together with many different stakeholders on a comprehensive sepsis plan for France that was published in October 2019. Antonio Artigas is Professor of Applied Physiology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona and Emeritus Director of Intensive Care Medicine Centre at Corporación Sanitaria Universitaria Partauli, Sabadell. He's Chairman of Edusepsis Programme and Member of the Executive Committee Committee of the European Sepsis Alliance. And during the last years, he's worked with the health department of the Catalan government to implement and follow up a sepsis code and a sepsis plan for Catalonia. And the last member of the panel uh, to introduce is Eric Soligard, who is a specialist in anesthesiology and works as professor and senior consultant in intensive care medicine. Uh, academic head of the Clinic of, of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care and Director of Gemini Centre for Sepsis Research at NTNU and St. Olaf's Hospital. His research focuses primarily to improve survival and outcome of survivors from sepsis through personalised mes- medicine developed by combining epidemiology, genetics, host pathogen interactions, biomarkers and clinical trajectories using systems biology and artificial intelligence. And with that, Dennis, I'm going to hand over to you to moderate this um, panel and to take questions afterwards. Yes, good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Louise, for the great introduction uh, of the entire panel. Uh, It's a pleasure to uh, be chairing this panel with uh, such eminent people from all over Europe who actually are very, very busy because of the COVID situation right now. So we appreciate the time. Um, We will get right into it. Um, The purpose of this panel uh, is really to uh, follow up and take stock of the um, World uh, Health uh, Assembly recommendation to all member states um, that uh, that uh, each of them, each of the member states, should really put in place uh, a sepsis action plan, a national sepsis action plan in most cases. And um, we thought it would be uh, it would be a, a good time now to take stock where we stand, uh, take some examples of best practices from around Europe, um, and so we will be hearing. Uh, from uh, uh, a number of countries um, around Europe um, to see where they currently are. Um, I'm going to ask our panelists first uh, to give a short introduction into uh, into their respective sepsis action plan, uh, what the contents are, what the status is, and then ask them a couple of questions. Um, And we will then also take questions from the audience. So I would very much encourage uh, people in the audience to submit any questions using the um, online tool. Um, I think uh, we will start uh, with uh, Christopher. Uh, Christopher, uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, the um, sepsis action plan uh, that you're working on at the moment, uh, I think, in, uh, in Sweden, please? Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Christopher Strulin, and, uh, and I have uh, had the um, uh, opportunity to work with the Swedish National Sepsis Plan. Uh, uh, actually, the Swedish Sepsis Plan, it started about a year ago. Uh, the Swedish government, uh, they asked for for different diagnoses that could be used uh, to, to build up uh, structured healthcare processes. And uh, they deposited the 90 million euros uh, for this process for, for four years. And uh, we applied for sepsis, and sepsis was selected as one of 10 diagnoses for the structured uh, healthcare process. So we were a group, a national group, a multi-professional, multidisciplinary group with uh, infectious disease specialists, intensive care unit specialists, emergency physicians, internal medicine physicians, 
uh, and the clinical microbiology physicians and also a patient representative. So we worked structured during the, the autumn of 2019 uh, and uh, we built up an algorithm uh, how to take care of uh, patients with suspected sepsis uh, in, in Sweden. We started in the outpatient uh, area where we used the sepsis stratification tool uh, by uh, uh, developed for, for the British NICE. Uh, and then we got into the hospital and we uh, suggest that patients with suspected uh, sepsis with the signs of infections and uh, 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 news 2 score of 7 or more uh, will be subjected to a sepsis alert in which uh, an infectious disease specialist should be involved. We also continued with uh, a structured follow-up, clinical follow-up of the patients with a telephone uh, conversation after discharge. Uh, in parallel with this, we we want to uh, to follow up these processes very carefully. And first, we want to uh, identify the sepsis cohort of the nation uh, electronically with our electronic record system. So we identify markers for infection and also uh, a SOFA score. A calculation, automatic SOFA score calculation, in which we required uh, an increase of two um, for, for sepsis according to the sepsis three criteria. Uh, and we also then have the quality indicators uh, regarding outcome and regarding uh, different processes. And finally, we have developed a, a consequence analysis uh, where, we, where we define positive consequences of, of this national action plan and also negative consequences. And the positive uh, uh, consequences uh, are, of course, uh, a, a better quality of care, which we think may, may uh, increase survival. And the negative consequences is the cost, of course, for, for the clinical follow-up, which we, do not, we don't have uh, structured today, and also for the electronic uh, follow-up. This would cost money, and also that we involve more infectious disease specialists in the emergency departments. So that's very uh, broadly our our national action plan. Thank you very much, Christopher. Much appreciated. Um, can Can I just ask a quick question um, there? Can you say one or two words about um, who was actually involved in um, in the development of the of the action plan? Um, w w w what was there? Was there a, a government government involvement there? Um, and and can can you tell us just very briefly about um, that setup? Yeah, first uh, in Sweden we have uh, about twenty different uh, national uh, um, program com committees for different diagnostic groups, and I, I I'm the chairman of the national commit program committee of infectious diseases, and all of us uh, were asked from the government to to nominate diagnoses that could be used for structured processes for these kind of processes. So our National Program Committee for Infectious Diseases, we suggested that sepsis was the most appropriate one to, to apply for. And then the Swedish government selected 10 different diagnoses, uh, and sepsis was one of the 10 that, was, that were selected for, for this kind of process. So we have fundings and we have infrastructure to build up these processes with support from the government. Great. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Um, let's go on to our next panelist then. Um, and uh, as a reminder, we will open up uh, for questions at the end of the panel debate. So um, uh, please do uh, submit your questions via the um, chat function um, that, you, that you see um, at the bottom of the screen. Um, uh, we'll go next to Ron Daniels in the UK. Uh, Ron, I know you're very busy at the moment uh, involved in COVID uh, response, but um, greatly appreciate that you were able to make it and uh, looking forward to your contribution. No, thank you so much, Dennis. And I'm sure I'm not alone in being increasingly busy right now. Um, so regarding what we're doing here in the UK, um, I think the first thing to say is that we have had an advantage in that there has been an intercollegiate body 
championing the government to improve outcomes from sepsis since around 2008, so 12 years. And we have had a national charity since 2012, so eight years. So when the call for national action plans came out in 2017, the British government was already writing its first action plan. And we're now on our third action plan. So I'm going to talk not so much about the action plans, but more around some of the principles and some of the content of them. And I'm speaking from the perspective of uh, the chief executive of the UK Sepsis Trust, the registered charity, very patient focused organization. But we've worked in collaboration with the Department of Health, NHS England, Public Health England and other stakeholders to deliver these action plans. The first sort of major point I, I wanted to say is that uh, the way the NHS operates, um, complex scoring systems, unless they fit closely with the news to early warning score, are unlikely to become embedded, particularly if they've been developed uh, elsewhere. So very early on, we recognized that we needed a pragmatic operational tool with which to recognize and treat sepsis. We looked to news too, and we established that taking some of the criteria from that, calling it red flag sepsis to empower junior health professionals to act would be a critical tool. We then developed the sepsis six. This was developed back in 2007 and it's iterated over time, but it ensures that uh, a simplified care bundle, including source control and antibiotics, including escalation to critical care where needed, but having the treatment coordinated by a senior clinician is effective. And those tools are now in use in 99% of British hospitals. So I think having the tools, the operational tools can help. And, and we've seen, if we look at the run chart, we've seen some outcome benefit from those tools. So the chart that I've shown, if you can see the slides, starts in 2016 and follows a commissioning incentive. So hospitals were paid more money to treat sepsis well. And what we found is that the rate of screening for sepsis in all patients in hospital who had a high news 2 score went from 40% up to 87% in just three years. And the rate of treatment with antibiotics across all English hospitals went from 32% up to 80%. So we seemed to have some process improvements. The next point I wanted to make is that it's very important to have advocacy, to have patient-facing organizations, to use patient stories, to engage the media, to engage business. So we've had commercial entities such as frozen food retailers, such as some of the very big companies, PricewaterhouseCoopers, all telling their staff about sepsis, telling their clients about sepsis. We've had major stories on British soap operas with 8.1 million viewers, in this case, Coronation Street. We've had campaigns across sporting events, such as the Grand National Horse Race, which is watched by 18 million people every year. We have advertising on all of our ambulances. And that is effective in engaging the public in asking the question, could it be sepsis, presenting to healthcare earlier. So you would hope that that would result in a link between improved process in hospitals and improved outcomes. And without that link, it might be difficult to see. Now, this is not cause and effect in the UK, um, but we've had three sequential estimates of mortality from sepsis. We accept that definitions of sepsis have changed during this time, but the process improvements seem to have been associated with an improvement in survival from sepsis from around 70% to just over 80% in the UK in just a few short years. So we'll be continuing this journey. We'll be having a next uh, sepsis action plan. We're now working towards an interoperable data registry using artificial intelligence to better understand this problem. That's where we're at in the UK. Thank you very much. That's great, uh, Ron. I think we'll go next um, to France, and we will be hearing from Jilali Anan, who will be um, telling us uh, about progress made um, in France. Hi, Jilali. Okay, so uh, yes, France has uh, uh, launched its uh, national plan in October 19. So basically, the plan is uh, uh, based on three main domains. First one is uh, increasing knowledge. The second domain is about providing better care. And the last domain is about increasing surveillance and coverage for sepsis in France. So just let, let me illustrate by one example what we're doing right now in France 
in these three domains. As uh, according to, uh, sorry, uh, uh, related to increasing knowledge, there are the targets are the general public and health professional. For the general public, what we are doing is we're implementing educational program uh, for school, for children and teenagers uh, that will be in place uh, in September 2020. So these educational program uh, aimed at raising awareness uh, among children and teenagers of the importance of infection, prevention of infection, and, and sepsis as the main, uh, the, the main cause of death from uh, infection. Regarding uh, the providing better care, uh, what, we, what France is uh, trying to, to promote uh, first is to reinforce the vaccination program. And as you know, uh, now France has increased the number of mandatory vaccines up to 11. So, because we really strongly believe that uh, vaccination is one of the main uh, tools to prevent sepsis broadly. And finally, to increase surveillance, so uh, beyond harmonization of, of coding for sepsis in France, um, we are taking the opportunity of an ongoing population-based uh, prospective cohort of 200,000 people being surveyed for 10 years. So uh, sepsis and, and surveillance of sepsis case among these 2,000 uh, French people to be surveyed for 10 years uh, has been implemented this year and will provide yearly uh, very useful information about the epidemiology of sepsis in France. So this is a very brief uh, a summary of, of uh, the national plan that we have set up in France. Brief, yes, but very thorough. Uh, thank you very much um, for that. We turn next to Norway with uh, Eric uh, Soligard, um, who will um, explain what's going on in Norway. Yes, um, thank you for inviting me to uh, to talk with all these people. Uh, it's very interesting to, to hear what others have done, and I will try to tell you a little bit about what we have done in Norway. Um, in 2017, there had been a lot of failures in sepsis treatment. Um, and I, I will say that the work to fight sepsis started in 2016, 2017 by a national inspection uh, by the, by the, uh, initiated by the government. Um, and it was a uh, set of teams around Norway visiting all hospitals around in Norway. And it was three visits to each hospital with journal reviews and interviews. Uh, and we went through a lot of uh, journals in the ED. Uh, and the main um, measure point was time to antibiotics given to patients arriving in the ED uh, with uh, infection and clinical signs of sepsis. And we also measured process variables like triage when they were seen by doctor, blood cultures, lactate, things like that. And, and the findings were that it was a lack of coordination and leadership in the hospitals. And many patients did not get antibiotics as early as they should. And um, after this uh, inspection, it was a lot of good initiatives. They, all of them were local. Uh, but we can see a kind of effect, at least a decrease in mortality over this period from 11.1 to 10.5%, and also a decrease in the length of stay. Uh, so it seems like the initiative had some uh, effects. Um, 
other um, things that has been uh, done is uh, this was followed by a governmental campaign or a program uh, as a national project on early recognition of sepsis in, in the emergency department and at the ward. Uh, it was a lot of um, attention on education, brochures, folders, e-learning programs, uh, contacts in every hospital, sepsis teams in the ED, and also monitoring. And in the ward, it was focused on uh, on use scoring. And this has now been implemented in the ED in all hospitals in Norway. And it's on its way to be implemented uh, early recognition on sepsis on the ward as well. Um, uh, other uh, measures that has been done, we have a popula population survey of 120,000 people that has been followed for 20 years. But one of the main challenges in Norway is the unrecognized burden. We don't agree on the burden of sepsis in Norway. Um, the official numbers are based on ICD coding. Um, nobody owns the patient. It's a discourse between intensivists and internalists. Um, and we also face a problem with lack of awareness in the population. Um, we have tried to get a national antibiotic guideline for sepsis uh, for the last four or five years, but I think we, we should have finalized it by now, but because of the coronavirus, we have had to postpone it. Um, but it, it's some very good and recent initiatives. Uh, it's of a national uh, action plan. Uh, the Minister of Health is really engaged and his eyes have been opened for what sepsis is. He has been participating in debates. He has been challenged. We have had the visitors from uh, European Sepsis Alliance meeting him. So I think we are on the way to get a coordinated uh, and national effort that includes also the population, uh, registration, uh, incidents of sepsis. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. And thank you also for speaking about some of the challenges there um, that you've encountered. Um, we'll come back to those uh, in the discussion. Um, I'd like to turn to our final panelist, uh, Antonio Artigas, uh, who is um, uh, going to talk to us about the situation in Spain and, and more particularly in Catalonia. Um, Antonio, over to you. Uh, thank you, Danish. So that uh, in the next minute, I will try to um, summarize um, what we did uh, for to design a territorial model of sepsis management in a European region as is uh, Catalonia. Uh, we should, uh, when we should uh, consider to create an inter-hospital emergency code, that it was, this was the main objective. And this is mainly because uh, the sepsis is prevalent, and as you see here in the, in the lower uh, part, uh, in the left side, uh, there is a uh, continuous increase of the incidence uh, in uh, in our uh, region, uh, and also the delay of uh, an adequate uh, early uh, treatment as antibiotic therapy, or a delay to transfer the patient to a, an appropriate uh, area uh, as an ICU. We know that there is an uh, important impact in outcome. So uh, we start in 2008 uh, with the local experience, and then finally in 2015, uh, the Parliament of uh, Catalonia declared sepsis as a public health problem and required for a creation and a strategic uh, plan 
uh, to uh, detect early uh, and to treat early uh, the septic patients. Uh, then uh, we establish uh, uh, through uh, an advisory committee uh, that is uh, was uh, an advisory committee with uh, different medical specialities, including pediatric uh, uh, the pediatric the pediatricians, and also all the uh, specialties of the uh, pre-hospital care, and. Uh, we were able to uh, establish an early uh, detection uh, based uh, on uh, very simple uh, uh, parameters uh, and also the initial treatment according to the, uh, the s degree of care of the different hospitals in our network. So uh, just to summarize you, Catalonia is an region of Europe uh, with close to 8 uh, million of uh, habitants and they have different uh, uh, areas and uh, these in these areas there are uh, hospitals of uh, primary care or for secondary care or for tertiary care and uh, that we try is just to give you an example in this area of the northeast of Catalonia uh, we distributed and we create a network uh, to define where the patients should be uh, treated according to the level of care. The level was uh, septic uh, sepsis one level or sepsis two uh, A or B level, and this is was that uh, primary hospitals are linked to the secondary or tertiary hospitals, forming a cluster to facilitate an homogeneous criteria derivation pathways and monitoring and feedback. Also, uh, we uh, uh, establish a training program and an accreditation of uh, quality care uh, on sepsis, and also a system that we call the radar sepsis, that to screen uh, and to, uh, uh, to have a continuous survey of uh, cases uh, admitted in, uh, and in our um, in our region, uh, in order also to uh, to analyze this data as uh, to have uh, continuous epidemiological information and also to give uh, feedback uh, to, to the different uh, hospitals. Uh, this is an example uh, using an APP uh, a system for pre-hospital and hospital detection that is linked uh, with the uh, health department uh, uh, informatic system. So uh, the uh, protocols for sepsis detection should be developed uh, by all healthcare workers. Uh, is not only intensive care, and from the domiciliary and primary care uh, uh, to high technology hospitals, uh, the patients uh, who uh, don't respond to initial treatment should be evaluated and place in an ICU independently if the hospital is a low complexity or tertiary hospital. Uh, we need to uh, assure that uh, antibiotic uh, administration uh, should be done uh, in uh, on time and uh, the same for the normalization of the hemodynamic uh, parameters. And finally, to have uh, or to give uh, feedback as a quality control system uh, to reevaluate and to improve a strategy and also uh, to be considered in the annual budgets of the hospitals. So this is just uh, the group, the multidisciplinary group uh, that uh, uh, finally uh, approve uh, the um, the strategic plan uh, for to implement the septic code uh, in uh, Catalonia. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, uh, Antonio. And uh, that concludes um, our first uh, panel statement. Um, I would uh, propose that we um, go on to questions. Uh, we have a few excellent ones already coming through on the, on the chat. Please keep them coming. Um, I will um, first 
uh, uh, try to um, summarize a little bit what we heard here without going into the details, um, of course. But um, uh, uh, I think the, some of the key elements of the sepsis action plans that we've heard here um, can be summarized together in a, in a, in a few points. One is um, the, the, that the action plans focus uh, very often on, or one of the focus uh, areas of the action plans are very often that uh, uh, they need to, they want to make sure that health professionals are aware of sepsis and know what to do when they um, when they see the symptoms. Um, another point is that uh, there is um, uh, very often the, the, the groups drafting. Um, action plans are multidisciplinary. Um, that, that's a word that came back several times. Um, there are um, protocols that are identified for treating sepsis patients that are to be followed by everyone in the health system. Um, and then uh, there is the involvement of actors beyond hospitals and the medical system um, in, the, in the strictest sense of the word. I heard in the UK the involvement even of companies as well as the major events. I heard in France the involvement of schools um, and some others too. So um, that's an interesting aspect, I think, of national sepsis action plans uh, there. Um, there is a key issue that keeps coming back, which is data, the availability of data and the use of codes for sepsis, coding. Um, and, uh, and and maybe we can uh, drill into those uh, a little bit more in in your responses. But I would I would really like to um, highlight maybe um, three questions to start with, and then uh, we will we will go to the questions that we've got in the chat. Some of these are related. Um, the first question really is that um, uh, not many of you, some of you were, were highlighting some of the challenges that were encountered, but we have heard um, in the past that uh, uh, we, we sometimes encounter uh, some resistance even from within the health systems, from amongst other health professionals when we try to um, talk about uh, sepsis and the need for sepsis action plans. I greatly appreciate when we go around the, the panel in a second, if you could maybe share um, uh, your experience in that regard. Um, secondly, uh, we've, um, I, I just mentioned data. There seems to be a generalized lack of data on the instance of sepsis. And is that maybe an area where a, a joint European approach could add some value? And then the third question is, um, are there any, when, when you set up a sepsis action plan in your country, uh, respectively. Were there any areas where you would have liked to see uh, more specific support from a European level that would have helped you speed up um, or draw on the experience? Or maybe you did already use some input that was available at European level. That would be quite interesting um, to know about. Um, what I propose that we do is that we, we start with those questions. Um, if you like, I'll go around the panel. I'll call um, each panelist, and if you'd like to respond to um, one or two, or maybe all of these questions, please um, uh, do. And uh, and then we will um, do a second round with some of the questions that have come through on the on the chat uh, in the meantime. Um, I hope that's okay. So if we go back to uh, where we started with Christopher, uh, would you like to pick up on some of these points? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, regarding the resistance, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, informed the Swedish healthcare system about our uh, national plan, and we've asked for comments, and we've uh, received lots of comments. Uh, and uh, we realized that uh, there are many, many, um, many different instances and uh, groups that uh, that have the power to say no and to say wait and to ask questions um, so and um, as as long as as this is within the healthcare budget it's no problem but as long as there requires more more money the the hospitals they say wait wait and uh, they really ask is this really necessary uh, but we've not uh, experienced any problems from from the other healthcare workers but but more from the the leadership of the hospitals 
uh, they've uh, questioned uh, many things, although many of them are very positive uh, about it. Uh, regarding the que second question about the incidents, that's what we what we really want to try to do. We want to try to uh, look into the record system in Sweden and find uh, ICD-10 codes of infection, and then also use an automatic uh, SOFA calculation uh, to have a baseline SOFA calculation and also uh, a SOFA calculation within the first 24 hours in the hospital and to see if, if the SOFA score has increased two or more. So then we want to, in that way, we want to identify the community onset uh, sepsis cases in Sweden. And uh, in that way, we could have an incidence. So that's, uh, I think, what I should respond. Thanks, uh, that's great. Um, Ron, um, any additional comments to that? Yes, I, th I think all valid points raised. I, I, I think people would expect me to address resistance in terms of the letter from Professor Mervyn Singer to the Lancet towards the end of last year, in which it accused the sepsis campaign of hype and hysteria and alleged a doubling of antibiotic use in emergency departments. I, I think it's important that everyone can hear that actually those data were very poorly represented in that letter. Antibiotic use in emergency departments did double, but that reflected a different way of using emergency departments. And total hospital consumption of antibiotics has remained exactly the same in the UK, as we've seen in New York State, as we've seen in Ireland and in other areas. So I think the resistance should be countered strongly with intelligent argument. On the data, uh, I, I hear colleagues talking about data and we talk about counting the number of cases According to existing wholly arbitrary definitions, you know, the SOFA score probably is as good as anything, but that means that what we have to define sepsis at a cohort level and an individual patient level is very poor indeed. And I think there's an opportunity to use data much more intelligently, patient level, granular, interoperable data that identify for an individual patient their risk of um, a massive inflammatory response to infection. I think we'll get to a much more individualized care. And on the, the final point, the final point, actually, I, I can't remember the final point, but the point I was going to make is there is opportunity. We, we talked about the need to engage with agencies outside the healthcare system, and that's important. But there is a huge opportunity and probably a need for public-facing advocacy organizations to support this. Doctors are not necessarily the experts in public messaging. Right. Thanks a lot. The final point was, um, uh, would you have benefited from European support anywhere uh, in your actions? Um, I, I think given that you were amongst the front runners, um, that's sort of self-explanatory, but maybe you'd like to comment. So, yes, yeah, thanks, Dennis. Thanks for the reminder. I, I think um, this is a, a problem that is not unique to the UK, but is particularly felt in the UK, that um, our government does not like to listen to European governments or to other governments. And we've seen some of this in the press recently. Um, so I think it's not so much that we would have wanted more help from the EC or from European agencies. It's that I would prefer my government to listen to other countries more strongly. Thanks very much, um, Ron. Greatly appreciated. Um, moving on swiftly to Jila Lee, would you like to pick up on any of those questions? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I think that uh, uh, many people here, at least in France, uh, still uh, are concerned about uh, confusing issues in between the fight against antimicrobial resistance and the fight against sepsis. And I, and I think here there is a uh, um, a need for clarification of the similarities in between the two fights, but also that the two fights are uh, synergistic and not redundant. I think this is important uh, uh, to be clarified for many people, many physicians, and also for politics, because many of them, they, they, they can't understand um, uh, what the difference between uh, the two issues of antimicrobial resistance and um, sepsis. Regarding the data, uh, I think uh, here in France at least, we, we think that one major issue 
as uh, being able to harmonize the way physicians code for sepsis because uh, it's, it's very heterogeneous and because of that heterogeneity in coding, then the numbers you can get from the uh, databases might be wrong, uh, either uh, underestimating or overestimating the number of cases. Mm -hmm. So we have started uh, um, working on a harmonization on the way of how uh, hospital stays for sepsis need to be coded in the French system. Uh, and finally, I'm expecting Europe to be more active. And basically, Europe need to develop, and I think the ECDC has a role to play here, uh, to develop a, a European surveillance for sepsis case, uh, harmonizing at the level of, of Europe, the way uh, uh, sepsis is coded, and, and uh, following, surveying yearly the number of cases uh, um, in Europe. I think this is really needed, and now it is missing. Okay, thanks. Great points. Um, Eric, any uh, additional points? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I, I think the, the first speakers, they have uh, touched most of it, but I, I believe that... Um, uh, early antibiotics for uh, treating sepsis versus uh, AMR development. That's really a key issue, and it's about uh, communication and knowledge. Um, because it is so many interests here, um, too many or very many uh, specialties they own the sepsis patient. The sepsis patient doesn't have one uh, advocate. I think that is a challenge. Uh, and it's also a struggle for resources. When we get more focus on sepsis, uh, both on treatment and, uh, and uh, on um, research, we challenge cancer, cardiovascular diseases. So, so it's, it's quite a tough fight. To, to get the focus on sepsis. And one of the big problems then is the lack of data, of good, reliable data. Uh, should it be based on ICD coding? It's a lot of discrepancies within the country on that. Um, so is a registry the answer? Should it be a European registry? Uh, there are there are many questions on that, and um, but uh, what what I think Europe should work on is to uh, harmonize data collection methods, so we can get an overview of of the burden of sepsis in in Europe, and and what um, the European support or what what should have been done. I think the governments should be challenged. By uh, by the EU, what are you doing on sepsis? Right. Thank you. I th I think that's a great point. Thank you very much, um, Antonio. Any other points? Yes, uh, I fully agree with my good friend Dizil, uh, and we are very close to the his uh, French view in Catalonia. Uh, the first question is the lack of information or the data. Uh, I think it's key uh, for uh, from our experience uh, to involve the health department of the government uh, to develop uh, uh, a system uh, to collect uh, the information in an appropriate way and to have a quality control of the data. Uh, and I think this is crucial because uh, the physicians in the hospitals uh, and the managers of the hospitals, uh, they don't want to invest more uh, money uh, to pay someone to collect uh, this information. So we need to improve the soft, uh, the informatic systems and to have a, a report on the epidemiology uh, information and to give a feedback uh, to the hospitals. And also to implement uh, this information uh, in the annual budget of the hospitals. That means if you are doing very well, 
then you will receive uh, more money uh, and you will increase your uh, budget. This is an incentive incentive uh, system that it works uh, quite well in my in my country. Uh, and also, uh, this could be linked uh, with the last question on research. Uh, I think uh, I will expect from the European Union uh, to work as an European Union. And these days we are looking or, uh, and seeing uh, the non-coordinating uh, acti- uh, actions. And, um, and I mean, uh, we need to work uh, more together. And, uh, and I will ask uh, to the European Union uh, to support uh, research in this area and uh, base it on a European network on sepsis that uh, give or can uh, assure a quality of the data and uh, centers that uh, are able to uh, perform quickly uh, um, prospective studies to answer the key questions on sepsis. And, and finally, the, the second question is on the other specialties. Uh, we had, uh, we have clear, uh, from the beginning uh, that, uh, the, uh, official advisor, scientific advisors of the health department of the Catalan government should be multidisciplinary. I mean, these uh, people are, uh, uh, nominated by each uh, uh, societies of the different medical specialties, and we didn't uh, uh, have uh, any problem uh, with them, uh, and uh, and uh, with uh, in, uh, neither with the microbiologist people or people from infection disease, uh, and uh, we accepted that. Uh, is important the resistance, the antibiotic uh, resistance, and we need to try to to do as better as possible, but always base it on objective data. Uh, I mean, if you have a good uh, system to provide you the information, then you can discuss and how to improve uh, in the next uh, uh, probably a month, uh, how to improve uh, the treatment and, and the system. And I think that, that's all. Thanks very much. Um, we are now in a, in a delicate situation because we have um, reached the end of our time, but we have some really interesting questions in the chat. So what I propose to do is that we do a quick fire round. I will, I will um, give you two or three of the key questions, and I would like to ask every single panelist to just come back really quickly with some really short points. Um, so that we can finish within the next five minutes, um, if that's okay. Um, I have a great question here, which says, um, what, is, what, what are the biggest obstacles that you encountered when you were setting up your, your uh, plans? I think we've heard about some of them. But more to the point, if we were, wanted to set up a national action plan in our countries, what should we do first? Um, could you give some advice on that, please? And then, so that's my first question to you. Um, what, what's your advice on what should be done first when you set up a national action plan in a country where none exists yet? And then what about in situations when resources are limited? Um, how, how would you advise to go about that? Um, and I think uh, that we leave it at that for now. So I will, I will do a quick fire round, starting again with Christopher, please. The, the obstacle is... The obstacle is that uh, uh, we are from different countries, uh, from different uh, parts of the country, different specialities. It's a challenge to to unite, but that's also the strength if we manage to 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 be gathered and have a message together. And also, that's the 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 issue. In order to succeed, I think you must be all specialties together to say we do this in our country. Uh, and in resource limited areas, you should focus on EC. You should uh, organize the resources you have in a more structured way. Uh, that, that's the key, I think. Thank you very much. Um, Ron, anything to add to that? Yes, so um, good points. I, I would add that uh, in terms of creation of a uh, new action plan at a national level, 
understand the actors in this arrangement. Uh, this includes patients, it includes ambulance staff, physicians, policy makers. We have to engage all actors and understand their needs for anything to be effective. Um, and then uh, secondly, in terms of the... Um, oh, I'm so sorry, Dennis. Uh, someone came to me and asked me about a COVID patient. I forgot the second question. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Resources um, limited. Is, what about when resources are limited? Uh, well, like every country right now, resources are limited. They're going to be more limited over the coming months. Do the simple things right. This is around recognition, empowering junior staff, antibiotics, source control. Great. Great, great answer. Thanks very much. Uh, Jilali. Yeah, I think that the, the main obstacle is uh, the restriction in human resources. You need to have enough, enough human resources motivated to to uh, to work with you to build a national plan. And the second point is, in, at least in France, there is nothing you can do if you don't have convinced political leaders. If there is no political leaders convinced, you cannot move on. Great, thanks. Um, over to Eric. Any insights from Norway? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think w w on national action plans, uh, I believe in numbers, and you need to get the overview of the problem, not necessarily on a national level, but some examples. And you need to engage all specialities and stakeholders. Uh, and for low uh, research setting, uh, I think uh, education, information, learning on uh, recognition and uh, treatment uh, is where you should start. Brilliant. Thank you. And then finally, Antonio. Yes, uh, for, uh, for obstacles, uh, I, I think uh, for the to implement the national plan, uh, I think, and I agree with Gil, uh, Anan, is that uh, to convince the politicians and to have an official involvement of the government, uh, advised by a uh, multidisciplinary uh, uh, group, uh, but this is, is key. Uh, and second, uh, for the resource limitation, uh, I think it's uh, uh, in our experience, and this was working uh, very well, is to establish different levels of care. And that means to create a, a network uh, to, care, to take care of uh, these patients uh, and to know exactly when, uh, where the, when and where these patients should be uh, treated or transferred uh, to a hospital that they have more resources uh, and more, uh, I mean, uh, possibilities to treat a, a difficult uh, case. Excellent, great, thank you very much. Um, uh, we've, we've come really to the end of our time. Um, it's been a great discussion. Thank you very much um, to all the panelists. Um, it, it's been uh, really appreciated that you've taken out time from your busy schedules to participate in this. Um, we've had some great questions in the audience chat that we've not been able to respond to. So if you would like your question answered and we haven't, we apologize for that, but please do send it to the email address that you see in the chat and we will um, endeavor to get it answered and come back to you um, as, as soon as possible. Thank you very much um, for participating. Thank you very much for the panelists and I hand back to Louise. Thank you very much, Dennis, and um, thanks uh, for the panelists as well. That was a, a really great session, I think. Uh, we're going to move on uh, swiftly now to the next keynote speaker, who is um, Mr. Anan. I'm not going to uh, introduce him uh, a second time because I did that earlier, um, but we're um, all very interested to hear his keynote speech on how COVID-19 relates to sepsis. So, Mr. Anan, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, 2019 novel coronavirus uh, hit the world right now. 
And uh, I would like to stress in the following slides uh, that uh, this is really uh, relating to sepsis. So we all have seen this, uh, uh, what is now the uh, world public enemy number one, uh, COVID-19. And I would like to stress that COVID-19 is not just infection. It is viral sepsis. And most, if not all, people who are currently dying from that viral infection actually are dying from sepsis or septic shock. At the time I have prepared these slides, on March 19, there were roughly 200 thousand cases in the world and about 9,000 deaths. But today, it is already 3,000 cases and the number of deaths have already doubled and is now close to 15,000 as per today. So really, this is an unprecedented pandemic and uh, uh, hopefully we will be able to go through uh, and to be able to minimize the number of, of, of people who will die from that uh, viral sepsis. Indeed, when one looks at the clinical phenotype that is now well, well described by many authors from China, Italy, and almost many other countries, including France, is that basically the clinical phenotype is really the one of sepsis. Uh, it's, uh, the, the infection is, of course, pneumonia related to COVID-19, and indeed COVID-19 is, in, is inducing a number of organ dysfunction beyond simply uh, acute lung injury and acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, which is very frequent, but in my unit, we currently are managing 25 patients with COVID-19 severe infection and sepsis. And I can tell you that 40% of these uh, patients have shock, that 25% of them have acute kidney injury, and almost all of them have disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, highlighting that the, there is a major derangement of endothelial function and also uh, suggesting that the host response uh, is uh, strongly deregulated, uh, uh, and this relates, of course, to COVID-19 COVID uh, infection. So clearly, we are facing uh, a viral sepsis as we never seen before. So uh, this is, uh, uh, the slide is just to highlight the time course of a disease. And this is to stress the point that uh, in almost all patients is, is, is very homogenous. The time period for uh, onset of sepsis or RDS is roughly in between day eight and day 12 from the onset of infection. And it's interesting to note that increasing data argue that this period of time is characterized by a rapid and sudden increase in circulating levels of a number of pro-inflammatory mediators. I'm just showing here in Telekin 6, tumor necrosis alpha, but it is also true for uh, many other uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And also I have a slide for that. It is more and more recognized that activation of complement factors uh, might, be, uh, an, might play a major role in the pathomechanism of organ dysfunction related to COVID-19-induced sepsis. So, to end my talk, this is basically uh, our daily, uh, uh, our, our days are looking just like this. We are all 24 hours seven caring for 
patients infected by COVID-19 and just presenting with severe, with sepsis and, and septic shock. And hopefully, we will be able to avoid this in as many of them as we will be able. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, remind the audience that uh, they can put questions um, to the speakers through the chat box. Um, I haven't got any specifically at the moment, but um, there was one question uh, about, and I think that this was referred to a little bit earlier, about the importance of working uh, on an international basis and on a, on a pan-European basis to sort of uh, tackle this issue. Is, is there something that you m might be able to say further about that? Yeah, I, I think that um, it's very important during a pandemic like this one that uh, the communication uh, within countries and in particular uh, within European countries is as smooth as possible because we all will learn from one from each other. And for example, here in France, we have learned much from our colleagues from Italy who were, uh, because uh, as you know, Italy, uh, the, 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 the pandemic hit Italy uh, above eight days before France. So uh, in some way, we were a little bit more fortunate and could learn from our Italian colleagues to know how we need to prepare ourselves and, and what we are going to, be, to, to, to face. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I have a question here um, about asking about um, uh, whether you started uh, protocols of immunotherapy in COVID sepsis. Yeah, I think uh, there is increasing uh, increasing uh, uh, attention that is paid to uh, trying immunomodulatory drugs. Um, so far, uh, the, the, as far as I know, there are ongoing uh, studies looking at uh, um, interleukin-6 uh, anti monoclonal antibodies against interleukin-6 receptor, for example. Of course, corticosteroids are being tested here, and there are uh, uh, people looking at way to, uh, inter to interact or interfere with the complement system as you know, there are already available in the market a uh, number of molecules uh, that are used to um, modulate the complement system. Okay. Another couple of questions. Could you tell us if you treated your patients with hydroxychloroquine? And um, <clears throat> another uh, question. Um, hold on just a minute. Um, to be sound disturbances. Um, uh, what sort of public message be given uh, to, to the people with respect to sepsis and uh, COVID-19, do you think? Yeah, so I'll the first question um, is that actually we're really using chloroquine, of course, because there are some data showing that you can reduce the uh, uh, viral load uh, in patients and, and there is no evidence for toxicity, at, at least. So uh, we are giving uh, to all our patients. Uh, and at the moment, we haven't experienced uh, several side effects. So I would uh, suggest using that, that treatment. Uh, and we've got the, the uh, message is that clearly uh, COVID-19 is killing people through sepsis. And there's now no doubt uh, about about that. So uh, uh, prevention, because we don't have treatment for COVID-19, uh, preventing people to get infected by uh, uh, having people staying home and avoiding contact with other people is really today the best way to uh, fight against the pandemic. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Annan. I'm going to move on now because uh, we have many other speakers to hear from. Um, and um, I would like to uh, introduce Mr. Abdulela Bahawatawi, who is one of Saudi Arabia's healthcare quality leaders and advocates, who was appointed Director General of the Saudi Patient Safety Center in 2017. He's a double board certified transplant transplant surgeon and also served as an assistant professor of surgery at King Abdulaziz University in Jeddah. Um, Mr. Um, uh, Okawasawi, um, the floor is yours. We look forward to hearing uh, uh, from you. We understand that you uh, you specialize in the Middle Eastern region but uh, also have uh, uh, global insights. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and, and, and thank you for the, for the nice uh, invitation to speak on, on, on this uh, very important meeting. So uh, basically, uh, you know, so, so over the next 10, 15 minutes, what, I, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, you know, uh, some of the uh, recent uh, patient safety uh, efforts that took place, uh, you know, at uh, in in Saudi Arabia, at the region, and throughout the globe. And then I'm gonna also uh, touch uh, on the uh, importance of linking uh, the two uh, global agendas: the global patient safety agenda and the global sepsis alliance uh, agenda. Which to us, these are very much, uh, uh, you know, f two faces of of the same coin. And then I'm going to finish off with just a quick word about uh, patient safety and COVID-19. So uh, uh, basically, you know, the past uh, 20 years have, have seen uh, a lot of uh, progress when it comes to, uh, to patient safety uh, efforts, uh, you know, either at uh, high income countries or low income countries but if you look at the uh, uh, the slide that shows uh, kind of a diverse uh, you know diff different countries uh, on the left hand side there is the uh, the slide with the green that shows uh, the magnitude of the problem uh, in countries like the UK uh, like the US you know the UK has 150 uh, people dying from preventable harm every week and this this amounts to like having uh you know uh, a 737 uh, max airplane crashing every week uh, and then if you look at the united states every year based on a, on a study from the bmj uh, 251,000 people die from from uh, medical errors uh, making uh, medical errors uh, and and, and harm the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. And in 2018, uh, I don't have this on, on the slide, but in Canada, there was also another study that came out showing 28,000 Canadians die from medical uh, errors and harm. And again, that was the third leading cause of death uh, in Canada. So if you look at uh, low middle income countries, uh, it is also a problem. And the National Academy of Medicine's report showed that 134 million uh, are harmed uh, by adverse events, and every year, 2.6 million uh, die from um, adverse events. So this amounts to five people dying uh, every minute. So the summary of this slide is uh, preventable harm and adverse events are a, a problem, a global problem of uh, both high-income countries uh, as well as low- and middle-income countries. So the next slide talks about uh, the reasons for the implementation gap. So we think if there is one thing that we did right over the past 20 years since the establishment of the is human, that uh, uh, the knowledge gap has been bridged. So uh, we pretty much know what to do, but we still have uh, a persistent implementation gap. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna show on, on, on and, and most of you are aware of the numbers uh, in, in sepsis as one example of preventable harm, but then there are so many others. And we presented uh, in the uh, in the G20 
uh, this year, which is the presidency in Saudi Arabia, we presented five reasons for the implementation gap. One is the safety culture. So if you compare the safety culture in, in healthcare uh, to other high reliability uh, industries like aviation, like uh, oil and gas, then there is still a big room for improvement. Uh, advocacy is also another uh, area uh, that has needs big big improvement. If you compare the the global advocacy of a topic like uh, uh, global warming, uh, global climate change, compared to the advocacy of uh, patient safety, you could see the the big difference between uh, between the two. Resilience is another. Uh, uh, area that uh, we need to do uh, more uh, in, uh, and and this basically is simplified into human factors and and ergonomics. And again, if you compare to aviation and oil and gas, where human factors and ergonomics is uh, integrated in every aspect of the processes, we still have a lot to 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 do in in, in healthcare. Uh, information asymmetry is a, is another problem, and 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 uh, that results in uh, harm to patients because uh, patients are not empowered. So we need more effective and practical um, and innovative uh, uh, patient empowerment techniques. And finally, we need to have uh, you know uh, common platforms to share best practices and 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 learning. So these were the five areas that we showed that uh, are the reasons for the uh, existing uh, implementation gap. Uh, you know, just take, for example, when it comes to common uh, platforms, that when, while we have uh, ICD, uh, International Classification of Diseases, we don't have uh, a similar classification for adverse events. So this is what the, the JEDDA declaration last year has asked for, which is to have an international classification of adverse events that is linked to that, that is the ongoing uh, ICD-11 that is being developed. Uh, so, so quickly, that uh, I'm, I'm going to skip uh, this slide. You know, the Vision 2030 came, came about in 2016, and the Saudi Patient Safety Center was established on, on, on 2017. Uh, actually, back on uh, Thursday, the 19th, we, we celebrated our third uh, anniversary. And even though that the center is uh, younger in uh, in uh, in age and in uh, you know human resources, but we have uh, big big aspirations uh, not only at the national level but also at the regional and the, the global level. And and recently, yesterday, the center was designated by the World Health Organization as a WHO collaborating center in uh, patient safety policies and strategies. So. Our vision statement is safer healthcare for all, and I think if you if you re, if you look at the slide, uh, we ha we write all in caps letters, and I think this is very timely now, because uh, patient safety uh, and workforce safety are interdependent. You know, we heard in countries like Italy where the uh, the, uh, the 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 level of uh, infection by uh, by COVID nineteen exceeds eight percent. Uh, and and we we recently have also uh, started having healthcare professionals uh, developing uh, COVID nineteen infections. So, uh, for our, in, in order for us to be uh, you know looking after the safety of patients, we have to make sure that the staff and the workforce are are safe. Our mission statement is is uh, you know mouthful, but basically uh, it can be summarized into. Uh, pushing for zero harm by working with with the stakeholders. So what happened in 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 over over the past uh, three four years? Uh, you know the 2016 uh, the global ministerial summit series was established by the UK and and and, and Germany, and uh, we participated in all uh, series uh, starting from 2016, which was in London, and then 2017, it was in. Uh, the uh, in Bonn, Germany, and 2018 was Tokyo, Japan, and we were honored to host uh, the 2019 Fourth Global Ministerial Summit. Uh, and 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 as as the largest summit, we we had almost 50 countries participating, uh, with uh, more than 24 ministers leading uh, the delegations, as well as the uh, the former Secretary of of, of uh, Foreign Affairs in the UK, Mr. Jeremy Hunt, and the Director General. 
Uh, and in 2019 also, you're all aware that the, the, the World Health Assembly resolution got passed and, and the, uh, which, which established the, the World Patient Safety Day on, on September 17th. And, and this year is uh, the, the year of the presidency of the G20 and, and, and we managed to put patient safety on the, on the G20 agenda. Uh, again, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip uh, some, some of these uh, slides. Uh, this is just uh, to show that uh, the number of uh, countries that have endorsed the JEDDA declaration on, 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 on patient safety was up to uh, you know, 24, 25 countries and, and still counting. Uh, one of the main outcomes that came out of the summit, in addition to the JEDDA declaration, was the, uh, the, uh, the white paper that we co-wrote with uh, ICN uh, to, to highlight the safety uh, of patients and, and, and you know, uh, in relation to the, to the nursing uh, ratios. I, uh, you know, I already talked about the, 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 the G20 and, and uh, basically we had two uh, working groups. Uh, one in January and one in 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 in, uh, in February, and and uh, sorry, one in January and one in March, and and the the third one will be in April. Most likely, it will be uh, a tele uh, conference uh, uh, meeting. Uh, the main outcome uh, for the for the G20 uh, was to establish a global patient safety leaders group, which will help augment and and, and accelerate the efforts to promote patient safety at uh, the level of uh, local, regional, and, and global. Uh, the, the, the Global Leaders Group will be chaired by uh, an international eminent uh, person with, uh, with uh, kind of a distinguished uh, records in patient safety. The, the deputy position will be co-chaired uh, by both uh, Saudi Arabia and, and, the, and the WHO, and then every country from the G20 will contribute, but also non-G20 countries could also participate as well. So that ends the first part of my talk. Uh, quickly, I'm just going to highlight uh, some of the important uh, aspects between uh, patient safety and sepsis. And I think most of these numbers are, are, are very much known to you. Uh, but if you just uh, highlight the fact that 80% of the, uh, of the uh, deaths from sepsis uh, could be prevented. Then you do the the, the math, and 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 you're talking about more than eight million people that could be saved uh, if we have uh, early interventions uh, to 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 deal with with sepsis. That's why one of the uh, main outcomes of the G20 will be uh, uh, an economics uh, of patient safety report that we uh, have uh, uh, asked uh, the OECD. Uh, to to write it and and one of the areas that we asked them to highlight is is uh, is also the the sepsis and the return on investment uh, uh, for the uh, sepsis. So I think this is uh, this can be very uh, helpful to the efforts of the Global Sepsis Alliance. Uh, so moving moving forward, I'm I'm just gonna highlight. Uh, a one um, a couple of words about patient safety and COVID-19. So uh, two areas uh, come to mind when it comes to how uh, important, uh, you know, the, the, the global patient safety agenda to, to this global uh, efforts on, on, on COVID-19. First, uh, you know, the basic IPC principles like hand hygiene and hand washing is, is, is very much uh, top of mind now to not just to healthcare professionals, but to the average uh, 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 public. And I think this is a time that we could highlight the importance of trying to uh, increase the hand hygiene compliance rate uh, to 100%, uh, to, to, uh, you know, as a, as a goal. As we know, the WHO uh, indicates that uh, the compliance rate in many countries is around 50, 60%. Uh, uh, at, at, at most. I think this is a time that uh, both uh, healthcare professionals and, and patients and families could uh, work together to aim for, for 100%. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned earlier is the workforce safety. 
I think this is a this is a time where we uh, have you know the 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 the, the great uh, heroic uh, efforts of healthcare professionals in in every country you know uh, go, you know going uh, uh, beyond uh, and 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 uh, you know putting themselves at risk uh, and harm's way to uh, to uh, help patients. I think uh, it is our duty to to make sure that uh, the workforce uh, are safe. Uh, not just physically, but psychologically, and they are supported with the, with the PPEs that are uh, needed. So uh, I hope as we move forward, we we, we highlight this this important uh, area and and the importance of that on patient safety. One other thing that we wanted to make sure that does not get overlooked is while we have a major focus and emphasis on COVID nineteen. Uh, we know that there are many, many uh, patients that uh, are in our healthcare systems that uh, do not have COVID-19, but they still need our help and support, and we want to make sure that we don't overlook them. Uh, this is why we're, we're in Saudi Arabia. We, we uh, collaborated with the medical societies to create a, a, a prioritization framework for uh, how to uh, classify patients into uh emergency cases uh, urgent and semi urgent and and elective and and, and uh, you know we're pushing that for elective cases anything that could wait beyond month a month whether as an outpatient or an inpatient setting to to wait but for a semi urgent and urgent as well as emergency we want to make sure that those patients are not harmed so my last slide is and in these uh, trying times uh, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm always uh, trying to, to, to kind of uh, be reminded of uh, these wise uh, words from, from, from Einstein when, when he said, you know, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that created them. So, so the thinking that created, uh, you know, 11 million uh, deaths from uh, sepsis as just one type of, of, of uh, harm that, that is preventable and, and the thinking that created so many other harms uh, that, that, that we, we need to figure out a different way to, to deal with those uh, challenges uh, to make sure that uh, we are improving safety and we're minimizing harm for, for all the patients. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Al Hausawi. Um, I have a question here for you that a member of the audience has uh, uh, put forward, and that is, do you see the possibility of using AI in combination with the right early detection protocols, um, maybe promoted on a Ministry of Health level, in combination with proper education as a way to lessen the burden of sepsis in the kin kingdom? Uh, and is there data on what percentage of hospitals currently use the early warning systems? So this is a very good uh, question. Uh, you know, as 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 far as the uh, the, the 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 exact data of of uh, the, the the early warning signs uh, compliance, uh, I don't have the exact numbers, but 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 it's still kind of. Uh, uh, less than, uh, you know, last time I checked, it was, uh, you know, less than 40% or, 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 or so. Uh, but when, when, when it comes to AI, I think this is where we have an, a, a great opportunity. And, and this is where, uh, you know, kind of this links to the saying that I mentioned about uh, the level of thinking that created problems. Uh, we, we truly believe that uh, early warning signs uh, if you leverage uh, AI, could could not become probably that early, you know, moving forward because uh, using AI and machine learning, I, 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 we probably could uh, try. You, you could catch cases, uh, you know, hours and maybe days uh, before uh, patients actually develop, uh, you know, more uh, clinical, you know symptoms and, 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 and more late symptoms. So uh, this is why we believe that uh, this, this challenge uh, cannot be solved uh, alone just by, uh, you know, clinicians. I think this is a challenge that requires the, the participation on the contribution of uh, many industries. And in this case, you know, the computer science and the, uh, you know, the, the, the innovation and, and AI industry is, is uh, very much uh, interesting. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, 
I'm going to uh, move on now to the final panel, um, which is focused on building support for survivors and families. And this panel is going to be moderated by Evangelos Morelos, who I introduced earlier. Um, he's joined on the panel by Annette von Butt. Butler, who's a communication scientist and survived a sepsis in 2018. And she has been driven by, um, <clears throat> uh, in, in her goal, uh, for more and more people to survive sepsis unscathed as a result of the high number of sepsis deaths. Uh, and survivors suffering long-term consequences in Germany. And her goal really is for more and more people to survive sepsis unscathed. Um, Christiana Hartog is a physician, a sepsis researcher, and a lecturer at Charité, and a co coordinator of the European Sepsis Alliance Working Group on Patient and Family Involvement. Idelet Nutma is a sepsis survivor, a former nurse and author and initiator of Sepsis in Dana, providing education, guidance and peer support in the Netherlands. And she's also one of the initiators of the Dutch Sepsis Network that's being developed with the support of the Dutch Ministry of Health. Michael Clark is a survivor of a septic shock and resultant ACV, which left him part, partly handicapped with reduced sight and a stoma. And Ulrika Knutsen is co-founder and communication manager of Sepsis Fonden, which is the Swedish Sepsis Trust. Evangelos, I'm going to hand over to you now to moderate the panel and to take the questions uh, from the audience. Well, thank you very much. And it's really a privilege uh, because now we will listen to, for the first time, to something that has never been uh, shown so far and which is actually uh, the experience of survivors and the real problem. Because, uh, you know, several times as physicians uh, who are just interested uh, on, recharge, on discharging the patient from our ICUs, we forget something which is crucial. What will happen in the trip of the patient as he's getting discharged alive from the ICU until he fully recuperates and he can be uh, socially active. So I would like to address the first uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Hardog. Dr. Hardog uh, is professor in La Charité in Berlin and she is also chairing the working group uh, on family and patient support of ESA. Uh, Professor Harder. Thank you, Evangelos, and, and welcome everybody on this interesting meeting to the ESA Working Group, Patient and Family Involvement. I'm speaking here also on behalf of my co-coordinator, Aurika Pripa, who is the wife, the spouse of a sepsis survivor. And uh, we have realized that not only is it important what comes after sepsis and the situation for survivors, but it is also important how families uh, can engage and are supported during the acute care in the hospital that uh, uh, shapes coping with this uh, disease and the aftermath after uh, afterwards. So on this slide, I give you an overview of uh, what we are doing and what we are trying to achieve. We believe that families, that patients, we have a voice and we should be regarded as equal partners in healthcare, equal to clinicians and working together. It is better to work together in the fight against sepsis. And how do we want to do this? We want to educate and want to help improve the education of the public so that people know about sepsis and sepsis aftermath and can act on this knowledge. And as you see, it's not only important to know, to have cognitive knowledge, but also to be empowered, to be able to act, to be able to speak to clinicians, to, uh, to, to ask them for certain things that are needed and that should be done. 
uh, we voice actively the need for rehabilitation and aftercare and there are practically no structures in place and we need to develop concepts for this. And, and I think the, the, the biggest challenge is that we strive for a culture change so that family-centered care becomes the norm throughout Europe. So how are we going to do that? Uh, first of all, we are a network network where we learn from one another. Uh, we share experiences back practice and we support each other with ideas and with uh, things like materials that have been developed and are being used. And as you can see, the first product that uh, we can launch during this meeting is a brochure that ha has been developed and is written now in English called Life After Sepsis Guide. It is meant for patients and families in hospital or after hospital. It uh, will be distributed through hospitals and through our network, and you can download it free from the website. Uh, and uh, it is in English, but we plan to translate it also into other languages. And at this time, I want to call also for volunteers who will help us with this. So I'm very proud and I thank the group for their dedication and hard work to make this possible. And it's a pity we do not have it in our hands printed today to to touch it and to, to show it to everybody. It's online now, so we look at it online and congratulations, I think, for the group for this first product. We work with national advocacy groups. We support uh, you if you want to set this up in your country. And I want to end with uh, my main message, and that is that actually now, as we are experiencing the surge, the pan building up pa pandemics of COVID-19, and we've heard how it's related to sepsis, so as the cases increase, we expect many sepsis cases, sepsis supporters and families in need, how important it is to give information and support uh, for families and sepsis survivors. And please keep in mind, even this new pandemic does not stop when hospital treatment is over, but there's a lot of need still going on and we want to address it. So thank you. Well, we do thank you, uh, Professor Hartog. Uh, are there any questions that we have for, from those who are attending us? If not, I would like to, because there are a lot of participants, and as you noticed, there is a short time available to each and every one, and then we will have a type of debate discussion. I think it's high time that uh, we understand what are the needs of the patients. So uh, I would like to uh, ask, uh, and I would uh, much uh, uh, invite uh, Mr. Michael Clark, uh, to give us uh, not only his experience as a sepsis survivor, uh, but also to tell us what are the main things that he would advise as physicians to improve in order to collaborate better with family and with patients themselves. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm sorry that I, I seem to have missed the um, booklet by four years on life after sepsis. Um, I suffered my uh, sepsis when I was uh, I just retired finally at the age of 69 from an international career with PwC. And uh, I'd been operated on um, in 1990 for colon cancer by a leading, in a leading Belgian university hospital, um, followed by regular checkups there and the removal of polyps and such like. But in early 2016, it was uh, decided that what was left of my colon should be uh, removed in a procedure which was presented as avoiding the need for a stoma. So I was operated on mid middle of March 
2016 by a successor to the professor who had operated on me in 1990 and followed me up until his recent retirement, during which time he had become a very good friend, luckily. After the operation, I started to run a temperature and my blood pressure was falling. My wife queried the slow response of the medical staff in the absence of the professor who had operated on me. She luckily contacted our medical friend. By then, I'd suffered a septic shock and was in a coma, indeed, for three weeks. Our friend monitored the remedial treatment, which included a second operation and the placing of a permanent stoma. He briefed my wife almost daily during the three weeks that I was in intensive care, during which time I'd suffered um, an acid, uh, thrombosis, two heart stoppages, uh, before my situation was actually stabilized. In early May that year, I was transferred to an independent specialized revalidation clinic in Kandal, near Brussels, which my wife had been recommended by someone in a bridge club. I then weighed 55 kilos, was largely immobile, with limited sight and a stoma. I was treated there until January 2017, first as a resident for four months and then three days a week as an outpatient. As a result of my septic shock, I'm officially uh, nine points disabled on the official Belgian scale with a stoma, hemianopsia on my right side, my 120 degree field of vision, uh, impaired balance, <clears throat> and some residual problems <coughs> with one finger, some toes, and a loss of memory. Um, <clears throat> however, thanks to my revalidation, I'm now able to regularly swim in the summer between 300 and 500 meters, walk up to 10 kilometers with Nordic sticks. I drive some 20,000 kilometers a year and spend quite a lot of time gardening in a very large wild garden. I had had to stop working as a volunteer executive director of an ONG, but I'm now working with them again increasingly. My very successful recovery, as I see it, is in large part thanks to the excellent revalidation program I followed at Inkendal. Um, positive and negative points. Well, official support has been pretty limited, principally to a European disabled parking permit and some tax benefits which I cannot profit from. Um, support from my wife in particular came largely from our medical friend, family and other friends. Apart from one brief checkup when I was still at Inkendal in revalidation, I have heard nothing more from the university teaching hospital in which I suffered my septic shock. That having sums it up and it highlights, I think, the, the need for, first of all, better sepsis awareness and diagnosis, even in a leading university hospital, keeping family well informed of what was going on, and particularly to provide good advice on revalidation and coping with sepsis, post-sepsis life, which I think where Professor Hartog's booklet should prove invaluable. Thank you. I do thank you very much for your presentation, and I would very much like to proceed to Ulrika Krutzen, uh, who is the sepsis founder of uh, uh, the sepsis network in Sweden. So uh, I would very much like to listen to your point of view. Okay, so my name is Ulrika Knutsen. Uh, I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Sepsis Fonden, which is uh, the sepsis uh, trust of Sweden. Uh, we started in 2015 uh, with two major goals, to increase the awareness and spread knowledge about sepsis among the public, the decision makers and medical staff, and to raise and give out money to research that can improve methods for diagnosis and treatment around sepsis. Um, so just to give you a little example of what uh, an idea of what we have been 
been doing in Sweden for the last five years. Uh, we have had a lot of conversations with sepsis survivors. And one thing that we found was uh, a great lack, uh, was a good information to bring home with you um, from the hospital after the acute illness concerning issues that you might face after sepsis, uh, a little bit like what Michael talked about too. So we put together a brochure, uh, not unlike the one uh, ESA now have uh, put forward. Um, so we put this together to describing the life after sepsis to give support to the pre uh, post-hospital phase, uh, both to survivors, sepsis survivors and their families. Uh, we have also started a forum on uh, Facebook. It's a closed group for uh, sepsis survivors and their families. Uh, and the purpose of this group is that its members can talk about their experiences with others in the same situation and discuss common issues uh, that they might have in their life after sepsis. Uh, and for us, this group has also been a great source of information concerning things that we in Sepsis Fund need to address, for instance, when we talk to politicians and medical staff and, and such. And then, of course, we've had five different World Sepsis Day events, uh, or from lectures to happenings to running events and so on. Uh, we also work continuously to inform Swedish politicians about sepsis, trying to educate them. Um, the image in this slide is when we had a lecture in, uh, in Parliament uh, last spring. And then, of course, we continuously also work all the time with increasing awareness around sepsis uh, through our social media channels, our website, and in Swedish media, and, and lecturing, and so on. So this is some of the stuff that we do uh, within uh, Sepsis Fondant. Now, i like to uh, take this opportunity to talk a little bit about an ongoing national campaign we have in Sweden as we speak. Uh, it's been going on for a week, and it's it's going on another week. Uh, the concept, Cirque Snaps for Sepsis, uh, aims to both explain to the public about what sepsis is, uh, teach them about the common symptoms and emphasize the importance to seek medical treatment quickly if you think you have developed sepsis. Um, the campaign is spread uh, throughout the country, uh, in street environments, public transportation and such. Um, and then we have also a big digital part of this campaign too, uh, with both uh, ads on social media, still ads, and also a campaign film that is spread on social media and on YouTube. Uh, and if you'd like to, to see this film, you can go to our uh, channel on, web, uh, on uh, YouTube or on our website. Uh, you can see this film if you're interested. And then, of course, there has been um, normal ads in newspapers uh, um, and, and, and online papers and so on. And we've also made a little card as big as the credit card with the symptoms that people can carry in their wallets uh, in order to have it always with them close by if they need to check what, what the symptoms should be. So um, this is some of the stuff that we have been doing in Sweden. Um, and we've, I think, uh, maybe we can come back to, to some questions later, um, Evangelos, but um, I, I have some more ideas of what we can um, focus on uh, helping patients, uh, such as survivors and their families further on, but maybe we should leave that for later on. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like uh, now to ask from Manette von Butler to present us her experience as a sepsis survivor. Hello. I had my sepsis in April 2018 after I injured my right numb on a rose thorn. That was on a Tuesday. The injury was very painful and after two days I could only move the thumb with pain. Nevertheless, I did not go to the doctor, but took ibuprofen. Saturday, I felt worse and worse. We had driven back home from the visit of my parents. There was a completely different, much warmer climate. So I thought it was that, that I was feeling so bad. In the night from Saturday to Sunday, I was scared to death, and I felt a knot come loose on my thumb and move along my, uh, and move along my elbow. At the level of the elbow, it disintegrated. I was terribly afraid, and my husband had to sit by the bed. Neither of us had the idea to call an ambulance. It was really weird. Sunday morning at 6 o'clock, I walked to the nearest hospital and introduced myself. There was no real wound on my thumb anymore. 
the doctor said to me, you don't have anything else, lie back down and keep taking ibuprofen. We were out of, the ibu, we were out of ibuprofen at, the, at home, so I had to walk to the emergency pharmacy. And on the way there, there was this huge fainting inside of me. I felt and I knew the doctor was wrong, but what could I do? So I took ibuprofen and tried to have a nice day with my two little boys who were three and eight at the time and my husband and spent most of the day again on the sofa. In the late afternoon, a doctor friend called. She knew about the injury and she wanted to know how I was doing and immediately asked how many milligrams of ibuprofen I had taken. 1,500 milligram, more than ever before in my life. She spoke briefly with her husband who was doing his specialist training in emergency and intensive care medicine at the time. And he immediately sent me back to the same hospital with a winter jacket, hot water bottle, deadly pale and weak. I went there again and could convince the doctor at the time to make a blood count. I had a raised temperature, which was helpful. The blood count was very conspicuous and showed an inflammation in my body. The whole right side of my body was already swollen at the time. It felt as if the two halves of my body had separated. The doctor gave me a dose of antibiotics for the evening and one for the morning to take home. The antibiotic is given for injuries with street dirt. Around 11 p.m. I got chills. It was another horrible night. In the morning I went to my longtime family doctor he partly retired in 2017, but he was still open for privates. He was immediately alarmed when he saw me and he prescribed the antibiotic for a week. So I had to pay it by myself and it cost only 52 euro. It saved my life. On Wednesday, he did another blood test. It was almost good. At the end of the treatment, he was shocked how weak I was and he was sure that one day after, or one day later, it would have been life-threatening and not to be treated in this way anymore. So I haven't been to the hospital. Everything um, I did was drinking a lot of water, taking the antibiotics and stay at home. Since then, I have developed a new allergy against roses and had prob problems with the right side of my body for two years now. I had an accident over 30 years ago, which also damaged the right side of my body. My hair has turned gray on the right side and I need a lot of exercise. Osteopathic treatments have helped me to reconnect the two sides of my body. Nevertheless, the right side is very, very sensitive. So what would have helped me in April 2018? It would have been a great help if I had ever heard about sepsis and its life-threatening development. I had some ideas and was waiting for the red line that didn't come. So I thought it couldn't be a sepsis. In February 2018, I took even part at a first aid course. There was no word about sepsis. The course was like just 30 years ago. The next thing that would have helped me in April 2018 was all doctors I was in contact with lacked up-to-date knowledge about sepsis and its possible consequences. In the emergency room and in the general practitioner's area, they have to be trained with the latest knowledge about sepsis. There's no reason to die or lose limbs for 52 euro in Europe in 2020. And sepsis seemed to have a very deep impact to the body and also changes it. As a consequence, healthcare professionals should think and act in holistic context from the perspective of the realities and biographies of patients. So what do I think needs to happen? 
patient experience and its implementation needs to become the leading purpose of the healthcare system to save humans from suffering sepsis. And it's a three-step development. On personal development level, there needs to be empowerment for the population in Europe. The pop Everybody has to learn about sepsis and its signs in first aid courses in films, flyers, and ads. And on the other hand, every healthcare worker needs to learn how to diagnose sepsis, the, the biomarkers about methods of diagnose and its treatment in online learning programs and trainings. Every healthcare worker must to be aware, must to be able, and needs to uh, be able to applicate the knowledge. In the matter of hospitals and the outpatient uh, areas, this organization needs to be reoriented towards the experience of patients and their healing processes. This includes communication skills and processes the same as working processes in hospitals or in the outpatient medical services. Like, for example, the implementation of rapid response teams in emergency rooms. In my eyes, it's very important that the new culture behavior in healthcare organizations is acting on eye level between medical staff and patients. And last but not least, the whole system. The healthcare system needs to be developed by key performance indicators that come from the patient's perspective, like preventable deaths, avoidable consequential damages, the frequency of interventions. And this must be monitored by an independent body. And I think attitude and purpose of the healthcare system in Europe need to be redefined by humanity, health and healing. Thank you. Uh, if I could perhaps step in here, I think we're still to hear from Idolet Nutzma. Uh, it, uh, would you like to go ahead, Idolet? Because I think that yeah. we've uh, lost Evangelos and we'd like to hear uh, from you. Okay. No, please. Well, first of all, I'm a grateful mother and wife, very grateful for a second chance. Um, it's great to be part of this. Thank you. Um, I was admitted to the ICU in 2007 with a septic shock, and it really struck me like lightning. And I remember my rapid deterioration and fearing for my life. And it was a really hard time for my family as well. Thank God I turned the corner. But during my recovery, I really felt in no man's land, with no aftercare whatsoever. Now that triggered me to bring all the information about sepsis and its sequelae together in a book. The book is called Sepsis and Afterwards. And I got the chance to offer it to the GSA as well. And thus I provided, tried to provide a clear lead to my fellow survivors. And I launched a website in the Netherlands educating the public and providing possibilities for guidance and launching uh, a platform, a private Facebook group for online peer support. And that works great because uh, people can exchange IDs and it works great. And what really strikes me is sepsis has got so many head hidden faces. It resembles a flu at first, but also the after effects can be so hidden. For instance, the neurocognitive sequelae, uh, a weakened immune system, uh, the tiredness, those are all 
hidden faces of sepsis. And when it comes to uh, early recognition, as said earlier, the public and professionals need to know that sepsis is really a time-critical condition. Early recognition and early treatment can prevent, prevent so much damage. And I'd like to emphasize this for another reason. On this very same date, five years ago, the 23rd of March, we lost our middle daughter due to a brain hemorrhage. And there was absolutely nothing we could have done to prevent this from happening. But with sepsis, it's a completely different story. We can prevent it most times. We are not powerless against sepsis. So that inspires me enormously to collaborate with the GSA and the ESA to fight against sepsis together. And in 2018, together with other fellow survivors and a bereaved person and Professor Peter Pickers, we offered the petition SOS for sepsis to the House of Representatives. And you can see here some pictures with an, uh, a woman who's an amputee as well. And a lot of media attention came out of this. That was really helpful. And in the summer of 2019, we received a letter from our Minister of Health promising uh, financial support for building a sepsis network in the Netherlands, in particular to enhance sepsis awareness, hosting a sepsis conference, with is, which is due to take place uh, 2020 or 21 to set goals with all the stakeholders and financial support for the Dutch sepsis guideline to be multidisciplinary extended, meaning attention for aftercare and cooperation with general practitioners. But this could never have been achieved without patient involvement. It is very it is a very powerful tool also to get the attention from the media. And the Dutch annual peer support meeting was in the 8 o'clock news on September 21, 2019. Sepsis survivors shared their story. Regarding aftercare, what I learned from all my engagements with fellow survivors and my own experience is this. Using and communicating the word sepsis and communicating the implications of sepsis, their after effects, uh, is key. We should support patients and relatives to better understand and handle the impact. So an information booklet at this charge is essential. Sepsis sequelae are very common amongst non-ICU survivors as well but this is still widely unknown. So let us support all survivors and their relatives with medical brochures they can take with them to their general practitioner, to their company or insurance doctor, thus helping them to be their own ambassador. Survivors need follow-up, including practical guidelines on how to strengthen their health Aftercare programs, including peer support, should be developed in collaboration with experienced experts. And expertise is needed regarding short and long-term sepsis sequelae and ways to reduce them. And survivors and relatives should be involved in research programs in this field and setting priorities in this field. I thank you very much for it, your attention. Thank you very much. And since there is not really much time left, I would like to address just one question to each of our uh, attendees in trying to uh, generate a bit of stimulating dialogue. So I would, uh, first of all, like to ask uh, 
uh, all, uh, all Ulrika. Uh, what initiatives would, in your perspective, help sepsis patients both in the acute phase of the illness and when they come back home? Well, uh, let me. I think let me try to answer. I think I could just make it out. I think he asked how we can improve the situation for patients in hospitals and their family members. We have listened to very moving stories which show that we have deficits uh, over the whole range of the okay. system. It starts in the preclinical, you know, in the emergency situation when patients are turned back, when, when family members are yeah. not heard, when they uh, call for help uh, because of two things. One is, of course, the lack of knowledge of uh, professional people. But the other is the traditional neglect of lay people's opinion. You know, whatever the patient says and family members say, it's not important. Medical experts have a superior knowledge. And this is what we mean when we say we need a culture change and yeah. we need to work together. We need to make clear and we must do this with a very uh, loud and and clear voice that we are not taking this any longer, um, okay. that uh, families and, and patients are uh, like underdogs in the hospital. We need to make clear how important it is to get their information and to get their help, uh, even up to taking part in nursing activities and then making the, the patient well. So this so is only can, just the beginning. Yeah. Can also Ulrika comment on the same question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so what I, I um, if I understand you right, um, I think there is really two fields uh, that survivors talk a lot about in Sweden, um, and one is that as we have talked about here now, that they find it hard to to get valid information during the actual acute illness. Um, I guess mostly that applies to the people around, the family around suffering, the, the person who is suffering from sepsis. Um, but another thing is that many survivors witness problems after they get home from, from, from hospital uh, uh, to get the right post-hospital treatment or even understanding for medical centers uh, uh, what they are suffering from uh, when it comes to complications after sepsis. They don't always understand the link between the, their complications and, uh, and their prior sepsis. Um, so I think there's really two things that we can do um, to, to, um, to help uh, sepsis survivors. Uh, so yeah, I think it, when it comes to addressing the problem with the lack of information in the acute situation, we need to get a better process, as we, as we said, with, uh, within the hospital uh, in place to handle the, the flow of information all through the clinical treatment to the surrounding family, but also to the patient. Um, that's one thing that is really important. And also make sure that when you leave the hospital, you have valid and solid information handed to you concerning what you can expect when you get home. But there's also, we, we talk about the life after sepsis. I think um, many survivors would like uh, very much to be helped, uh, if, be very much helped if we create some kind of more post-sepsis clinics. Uh, I think this is something we need to look at where you can have cross competence from different medical disciplines who are focused on the post-sepsis complications, whether it's physical or mental issues. Uh, that's one thing that we'll be looking, looking at in Sweden and have some, some pilots uh, going on too. But I think that's something we really need to be better at. Um, so it's really, as we said before, it's from, from the acute situation, from the ambulance, the information flow, and also be able to to listen more to the people who, because you know, if you have sepsis or the, the, the people close to you know, this person, my, my husband or my wife or my child or my mother, she is not herself. There's something severely wrong. We need to listen to them. And we also, in the campaign that we are doing right now in Sweden, we, we there's a, a phrase in the bottom of this whole uh, message that when you get to the hospital or the medical center, don't be afraid. Just ask. Just like in, in the UK, that's our message. Just ask, could it be sepsis? Because I think sometimes the medical staff, is, it's not on the top of their minds 
uh, all, all the time. So that, that is also important, I think. I would like to uh, ask based on this, uh, Michael, uh, and of course I will address the same question to the uh, rest of the panel. How ready do you feel uh, the relatives are to listen to the uh, shocking words that, uh, from the physicians that uh, their relatives are suffering from sepsis and how will they deal with this? Well, in, in, in my personal case, um, it would have been pretty disastrous had it not been for the fact that we had a very well-qualified retired medical friend who was able to brief my wife in the absence of any briefing from the uh, professor who had actually operated on me, who was notable by his absence. Um, and indeed, the medical staff excluding one or two nurses, who apparently when I was in the ICU, at one stage I was linked up to a machine to uh, transfuse uh, slightly cooled blood um, to keep me going. And at least one of the nurses was prepared to explain to my wife what was going on. But that was a little bit of rare um, occurrence. I think the, the, there's a basically a, a, a not just a lack of and it's in my experience, a lack of understanding of sepsis by some medical professionals, but also a, a lack of capability to interact with family and the patient, him or herself. Uh, I think that's something where, at least in Belgium, some attention needs to be paid. Uh, what has been said by um, the other members of the panel, I think, is all very relevant. But it comes down to frankly, uh, basic, um, I'd say, correct behavior towards the patient. Uh, what time that would uh, I, would, this? I would just add that the, Sorry, the contrast apologize. between the contrast between the uh, university hospital where I was <clears throat> suffered my septic shock and the excellent revalidation clinic which had a very interesting team approach to revalidation, um, starting off with questioning, in my case, me, uh, as to what one did before. And they, they had the stated aim of trying to get you back to where you had been before, or at least <clears throat> as far as that was possible. In my case, they, they set an aim of about 95%. And they had a very interesting team approach which included the kinetherapists, the, a doctor, uh, a psychiatrist, a social assistant. And I noticed all very young, and they had a, a very good approach. It was almost competitive against other teams surrounding other patients in the neurological uh, ward where I was. And that made a real difference. I mean, they spent two months training me to be able to drive a car again. A little details like that. So I think Thank more you. attention to interaction with the pa patient and family in the hospital and particularly good revalidation. Thank you very much for that. I would like to ask uh, Annette, uh, do you uh, believe that uh, if uh, people was aware that uh, uh, early admission to hospital helps, uh, would that help tremendously if we could uh, more efficiently provide this uh, uh, message to the society? Yeah, I think so. The earlier it's, get, it's noticed uh, that something's wrong, going wrong with you, um, the more or the, the less consequences you will suffer from the sepsis. And um, I think it's a combination of, uh, of knowledge and of behavior in the hospital and even afterwards. And nobody, my doctor didn't know that there are consequences from sepsis for, from, you know, if you are not, um, in the hospital, 
he thought there were no consequences, but I was so weak afterwards for weeks. It it take it took several weeks for me to get back in the everyday life. It uh, and that's also a lack of knowledge. But he, he was very empathetic, and and since he knew me for so long, very friendly and helping. But um, this is the attitude that I'm missing. Um, in many hospital situations, it's just as if they have a different focus than humans. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Italet a rather, let's say, provocative question. Uh, it is highly probable that uh, at the end of the COVID-19 pandemic, not just patients, but also all of us, are now in a situation of restriction to our normal activities. Uh, it will be very difficult to recuperate. So mm -hmm. do you believe that the teachings coming from sepsis survivors should now be implemented in the entire society? Yeah, I think it's very important to ask uh, survivors what they find important um, in their recovery, what what uh, does quality of life mean? Um, so um, I think they have a lot of expertise on uh, the after effects, and that expertise is not being used right now. And uh, it should be, because uh, they are the ones who can tell about uh, neuropathy and uh, uh, concentration deficits and memory deficits and uh, all kinds of pains and the tiredness. And um, I think um, that an aftercare program should be uh, built up together with experienced experts uh, because now there's no aftercare uh, specifically for uh, sepsis and their uh, relatives. So I think the, the uh, experience, the, the, the storytelling is, is really uh, very important, spreading, uh, spreading those stories. And uh, I think by the means of a network in all the countries, uh, to incorporate those experience stories and share them with professionals is, is the right thing to do and um, um, to uh, enable professionals that they can make the link as well. When you go to a general practitioner and you complain about the after effects like a lack of concentration and that your general practitioner uh, can think uh, of, um, of this link, the link with... Uh, sepsis and uh, brain damage uh, because there is a link, although you often can't see it on an MRI scan or a CT scan. And that link isn't being made right now, so people are struggling to rehabilitate in their work, but uh, often they don't succeed and they need that support and that recognition. Well, I would really very much like to thank all the panel and I think that was really stimulating. And for me as a chairman of the ESA, it was really a great uh, opportunity because uh, as I mentioned earlier in the question that I addressed, uh, I really feel that uh, uh, the teachings that are coming from our patient survivors uh, are the teachings that we are uh, in need of all of us who are now are facing the COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, I would uh, like to conclude uh, this uh, uh, ESA meeting and uh, uh, there is no doubt uh, that uh, all of us who participate and who are dealing with patients and our survivors uh, are know very well what sepsis is, but it's important that through this uh, uh, web uh, conference that we had today and webinar, uh, I think that it's obvious 
particularly now in the light of the new COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, that uh, we need to become much more fighters, that we need all of us to learn to collaborate. And actually, I think it's high time for all governmental authorities around the globe to change the way they per perceive about sepsis. Uh, you know that the European uh, Sepsis Alliance has started to grow, and that's very important. We have already three working groups, one on policy and stakeholder engagement, one on research, and a third one on patient and family support. And uh, I believe that all of you who are participants and all of us who are members of the steering committee of the SA should embrace these working groups and please have advice whether you would like to become their members or not. Finally, I would like not just to thank all of you, because without you, nothing, uh, this event could not have been possible, but I would like to thank very much uh, those who offered the technical support in such a short time and managed to make the ESA webinar a real uh, successful event. These two are our technical partner, NC3, and all the ESA uh, team, and I would particularly like to, to address warm thanks to Marvin Zink. Thank you very much.